OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Half past seven this uh, Thursday morning. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jerry Roy and Sheen with you all the way through until 10. We'd love to hear from you. There's plenty going on in the world of sport. Loads for us to get our teeth stuck into. The return of Stephen Cluxon to training just minutes after uh, DB had said he thought he had retired. The, the evidence certainly made a compelling circumstantial case. Uh, we'll see what Kieran Kilkenny has to say in the papers a little bit later on. Apart from that, there was a Titanic night last night in the football, where at one stage, Owen, it looked like I was going to be walking in going, well, how do you like those English apples now? All they've got to do is beat Hungary to basically reach the finals. Are you not going to do that anyway? Is this German team really one that you're, you and your bandwagon fear? Uh, so, in 2002, when the World Cup was on and Ireland was riven by the Saipan, post-Saipan civil war, the stings in and out of RT's World Cup coverage was an ad for MasterCard. They were the, the tournament sponsors for the TV. And um, they had the, you know, the, the MasterCard logo is two, two globes, two balls in different colours. I think one's red and one's yellow. And the, they had turned the two balls into puppets. And the only thing that I remember from that is like the two Dublin balls, puppets, saying, do you know you can never write off? And then they looked at each other and went, the Germans. <laughs> and I was like, in, in 2002, that German team was not good. And we'd written them off because Ireland had been able to equalise against them in the group stages. And then they went all the way to the final. With Oliver Kahn producing this mad performance that ended up making him... Was, did he end up stealing the Player of the Tournament award from the real Ronaldo? I'm not sure. But certainly he was in, uh, in competition for it. And so, you know, that was a team that you could write off. And this is the kind of a team that you could write off, particularly last night when uh, they just completely fell asleep after they'd equalised. It was like, oh, well, this job is done. Thanks very much. We're at home. And who is this crowd anyway? Oh, they just scored again. Can they do that? Are they allowed to do that? How did that happen? So I'm not writing them off. I'm definitely not writing them off. I, I can't wait for this game. It's like, it's going to be brilliant. Look at all the ghosts that are already shuffling out on the pages of... This is like the immediate post-match reaction in England has been, oh, Jesus Christ. Imagine what it's going to be like after like three days of national psychosis, penalty shootouts being replayed, agonising misses from a few inches, mm. uh, dodgy goals looping over goalkeepers, offsides. Like, how many times... Do you have to watch the video of 1966 to expunge all of the other stuff that's happened in the meantime? A lot. A, a lot. Like, it, it has the potential. I'm not sure whether it's the BBC or the ITV who has, the ITV says the dad here, uh, who has the actual rights to uh, the, the broadcast. Um, but it's going to be one of the most melancholic British television moments of all time, you'd suspect, because, like, I mean, they, they've shown incredible form so far in dipping into the reservoir of 1996 content they will dip right back into that reservoir over the next little while and uh, and just break the hearts of english people before a ball is even kicked which maybe is a good thing like i mean i'm, I'm not sure did you catch the opening game against croatia but they had this montage of all the english disappointment over the past 25 years and it was just uh three lines starting to play and then it stopped and then it started to play and they literally played the song 12 times i'd say throughout the course of the montage so i'm wondering where do they go now from here? Where do the BBC go from here in order to find the right way to tug at the heartstrings of the English public? What piece of music from 1996 could possibly work in this instance? It's like surely the, the well is dry on this front. We have seen everything. But I, I suspect maybe, maybe there's more to come. What do you want to happen from this point forward? Stick your, stick your uh, post-colonial inferiority complex in your back pocket. Stick your schadenfreude away for a moment. What do you want from a football perspective? And then you can tell me about the schadenfreude and the post-colonial inferiority complex revenge fantasy that you have going on. But in the, from a football perspective, what do you want? I guess... I, I, I guess the better storyline on a purely footballing level would be England winning and getting to the final, because I think England have a better team than Germany, and England have been better than Germany, I would say, overall in the group stages. Like, England have been average, and Germany have been bad, with the exception maybe of, of the Portugal game, where they were actually very good. <laughs> but last night, they were very bad, and I think what England have shown is that they will grind out a 1-0 win against average teams by playing just a little less average than the team that they're up against, because they've got much better players. Germany last night almost got beaten by Hungary. That would not happen to England, this England team, as far as I can see. So, Did we underrate Hungary, though? Because like, Hungary gave it, gave it all to Portugal until the last 15 minutes. And obviously, 
held their own against France, who everybody's like, oh, this France is the greatest team of all time. Oh, look at this. They're absolutely amazing. They're on the verge of history. And then it's like, uh, and last night they were pretty good, no? Like, I, I, I guess so. And may, maybe we did completely underrate them. I, um, I guess maybe the, the, the France results probably franks that. I don't know, to be honest. I don't know enough about this Hungary team to know whether or not they're any good or not. I watched them play against Ireland before the, the tournament started, and they were very poor on, on that night. That was their, their big send-off. And that was what we were judging it on. Their best player, Sabazlai, was not going to the tournament. And we all said that, OK, well, the, the Hungarians are screwed without their best player. And they will almost certainly finish bottom of the group with zero points. Last night, they'd, they'd almost qualified. So maybe they are a lot better. And maybe, maybe it's an injustice to, to Germany. But I, I think on the balance of things, England go into this game in better form than Germany do. OK. And then from a schadenfreude post-colonial inferiority complex, tell me, which which point or how do you want the the inevitable calamity that is impending for English football to unfold? Well, Who's your favourite fall guy? Well, I, I'm just thinking here that the BBC should actually just make the montage live. So when Germany have gone won the up, that like I mean they've already dipped into to the reservoir of 1996 content. So I was just looking through the 1996 chart here for other stuff that could work perfectly for that montage. So I would probably be going for what becomes of the Broken Heart by Robson and Jerome for the, the montage immediately and just have it ready at half time. After Thomas Muller puts Germany up after eight minutes and then they subsequently hold on to the lead for uh, 72 minutes, uh, 82 minutes. Robson then. or Jerome ends up in uh, Game of Thrones, right? It's a good point. I don't know which one, but that definitely rings a bell. Uh, like right up there with the Ed Sheeran uh, kind of comparison. Oh no, this, this was, he, so he was the sidekick. He was, uh, you know, the wise cracking sidekick to the incest prince What's his name? I can't even remember this. I watched every single episode and did a podcast on it at one point. Very 2014. Let me uh, cast my mind back. The, uh, the brother and the sister. Yeah. What are they? Yeah, the, Jamie and Cersei. Jamie's sidekick was, was Robson or Jerome. Right, okay. I did not know that they yeah. had such a significant role. I genuinely thought it was a cameo. Uh, like, did Aaron Rodgers have a cameo as well in Game of Thrones? Who? Aaron Rodgers. Did that, did that happen? I think am so. I, am yeah, I making he, he stuff did, up? Yeah. Bron. Bron. Oh my God, I completely forgot about that. Uh, right, okay, well, they, I mean, he could just come out in his armour and, uh, I don't know, slay the, the English dragon and that could be how they do that. But just have it ready at halftime, basically, is, is what I want to see. That, that's the, the level of schadenfreude I think we could, we could all get behind. Okay. Uh, from a football perspective, last night was amazing. And so I'll have no more of your nonsense about this tournament not being a good format or any of that kind of stuff. There might have been a few dud games along the way, but let's be having it. Come on. Yeah, it was re really, really good night of football. Obviously, the group of death ended the night the exact same way it started. Uh, so it, uh, uh, you, if, you, if you're of a very functional mind, then you could say, well, what was uh, the point of, what was all this fuss about? But if you're of a, a romantic mind, then you're like, this is... Or if you have on. a brain, go on, go on. If you have an actual brain as opposed to a functional mind, it was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a really unbelievable night of football, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely class. Very, very backhanded compliment there to... Uh, very dramatic night. And Spain are back. Yeah, Spain, uh, like, uh, the, the one thing, the one thing that is disappoint, disappoints me about that, um, the Spain game is that the, the Martin Dubravka thing is just going to be lost in the ether now. Everybody will forget that one of the great own goals of European football was scored last night, but because they got hammered in the end, no one will, no one will remember it. It wasn't important in the end. I mean, it might have been important in terms of actually breaking their spirit when uh, one of their best players ends up throwing the ball into his own net. The, the addition of the two own goals to the, the gloss of Spain's performance, I think maybe Farron Torres' goal is going to get forgotten about. In um, When the tournament wrap-up is finished, no one's going to be going, oh, I remember Farron Torres' first touch was a back heel running away from goal. Beautiful finish. Like they, I, I do wonder if the Spain team are actually going to be the ones that kind of step up over the course of the next couple of weeks, like the, obviously everything in that side of the draw you can't really be sure of, but wouldn't mind seeing this, this Spain team go up against France in the, the quarterfinals, which looks like a relatively likely outcome. I know Croatia have also found their form and that, that should be a brilliant last 16 game, but I just wonder what, what can a, a win like that do for a team when we've been deprived of a truly outstanding team. I think that's why like, I think 
England are probably going all the way to the, to the final at this point. England versus Netherlands should be a, a cracking semi-final, but I think if you just look at anybody who's been flawless in this tournament, you're not going to find a, a single team. So uh, it, it's, it's beautifully flawed what we've seen so far, and it's, it's very, very hard to call who's actually going to come out on top now. In terms of missing out, right, the England-Germany game would have been in Dublin if uh, everything had been grand or if we decided that we were going to be okay to take 11,000, 12,000 spectators. Um, I, I think we're missing out. I think it would have been an amazing spectacle to see the Aviva full, or the Dublin Arena, or whatever they would have had to call it. Uh, I, I would have definitely have liked to have seen what would have happened. I mean, how many England fans would have come? A lot, I presume. Uh, would they have been very well behaved? Would we have corralled them into Temple Bar and let them take their tops off and sack the city? Or I don't know. What would have happened? That's exactly what would have happened. I see Dan McDonnell last night saying that in an alternate universe, the English fans would be white water rafting before heading up to the Aviva for their uh, last 16 game, which, which would have been good. Like, I mean, um, maybe we, we could have uh, introduced them to, I don't know, the, the, the Viking Splash Tour or something like that. And... Uh, showed them how uh, terrible people once conquered Ireland and they would have uh, sympathy with the, the Irish plight. Maybe that could have been something that could have happened. But other than that, yeah, just put up fences around Temple Bar and uh, let, them, let them throw their projectiles and uh, get them in the mood for a cracking game against their old enemy. Maybe the thing to do is to give England every tournament so that the England fans don't get the opportunity to travel away. Is that, is that how we fix the problem of English hooliganism when it comes to football around Europe? Yeah, possibly. Uh, possibly we would be uh, deprived of our of uh, Michel Platini's uh, amazingly loved uh, intercontinent or th throughout the continent tournament, which 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 will probably get another run out, I guess, at some point in the future, given that this was in the middle of a pandemic and this has been a little bit affected. But the television spectacle has at times been excellent, and uh, obviously the, the the Germans are going to host the next one, and it'll be a tour through Germany, which will be a, a brilliant tournament for for English fans included. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that I, I think that the, this thing should probably be tried again in in post-COVID times. Yeah, in uh, seven years' time, we should go back to doing this, and we could have England Germany. What would what would like honestly? What would England Germany be like? Do you think it would be totally fine? Do you think there would be issues if it was being played in Dublin against the backdrop of Brexit and the row about the backstop and the border in the Irish Sea and the DUP issues? I mean, am I wrong to conflate all these things as being a culturally significant moment? Or is it just a game of football between two uh, completely different countries at a neutral venue? Yeah, no, I, th I, I think that there would have been, there would have been something. Now, of course, what uh, Ireland's response to that being the, the petri dish of all of this would have been to, to send out the finest bartenders and waiters around Dublin to roundhouse kick the head off all the English fans who dare step out of line over the course of the couple of days that involved the, the England versus Germany game. So there would have been a, a, an apt response, but you can't imagine that things would have gone off perfectly. Like, uh, probably a, a little bit of trouble, um, which, which would have manifested itself in grim exhibitions maybe of slight violence on, on, um, on social media, whether or not it would have ex escalated into like front page news or, or something truly horrific, I'm, I'm not quite sure. An interesting thought experiment. Um, the policing of it would have been interesting too. I'm sure a lot of videos would have been circulating of the riots in 1995 at Lansdowne Road. Yeah, and like, so like, I mean, there would have been, like, as you point out there, there would have been an Irish element to this as well. This wouldn't have just been Temple Bar playing host to England fans versus German fans. There would have been, I presume, a lot of Irish people who would have actually had tickets to, 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 to that yeah, last 16 game. that's the thing. I think everybody, there would have been at least a quarter of the stadium uh, filled with Irish people, who I presume were would cash in tickets going for 10 times their face value already before the hype machine kicked into full overdrive so that's what they were reporting last night which means that it could get to who knows how much by the time uh, the actual match comes around so a reminder at 7.44 this morning OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors here's what's coming up between now and uh, 10 o'clock on the show this morning Philippe O'Claire is going to join us in about 5 minutes time We'll run you through the sports pages at 10 past 8. James Scale is going to help us to preview the uh, start of the uh, All-Ireland Championship proper, really, in hurling, obviously, the Munster and Leinster Championships. Uh, we have our TV picks with Sue Murphy coming at 8.50, and then at 10 past 9, Eamon Fitzmaurice, free from the pressure of being the carry manager, has been in conversation with you, Owen. The big news from uh, the Gaelic football world over the last 24 hours or so was that... Um, 
the word on the street was that Cluxon had retired, but uh, Kieran Kilkenny nipped that in the bud a little bit yesterday by saying, "I ah, know he's back. He's back. He's back training." Yeah, he was out doing media yesterday. So uh, Stephen Cluxon, by all accounts, is is back in training with Dublin. I mean, he's been uh, there's a slight speculation I would have thought around uh, his future. It kind of had reached ahead yesterday uh, when David Brady was on here saying that he thinks that that Cluxon is gone. Uh, I wasn't sure, like because Nick Galvin had obviously been asked about it pretty much after every single game. I think after Donny Gall, he said he was soon to come back. As I pointed out yesterday in Thurles, he said that he was soon to come back. But you just don't know in, in these situations. Like I think that there's been a, a number of unexpected retirements managerially and when it comes to players over the last couple of years that seem to happen at strange times. So you wouldn't have put a pass and to have retired in such a way. But it does seem if Kieran Kilkenny is coming out, then uh, all is well and he should be back between the posts over the next few weeks. Yeah, do you think he automatically gets straight back in the team? Is that what happens? I think so. I think that if you've got Cluxon in, he, he has to play, because he's your captain as well, as much as anything else. He is your, your leader, he is the, the guy who's proven himself to be flawless at times in the, the biggest occasions, and uh, I would, I'd be very interested to see how they get on with a full in a full season without him, because they've obviously gone through league campaigns, and have been relatively beatable uh, or have been not, not, uh, relatively mortal uh, at times during league campaigns but I don't think that's down to Cluxton's absence at all. I think that, that there's a number of different factors at play there so uh, one suspects that once Cluxton steps away there will be a little bit of a betting in period for Evan Comerford assuming he will be the man who gets the jersey but after uh, a season or two it'll be like okay this is just Cluxton 2.0. How was the uh Kerry hype meter when you and Eamon Fitzmaurice sat down to try and... Not great, actually. I think I came into the conversation with greater hype. He definitely seems to be of the opinion that Dublin were just in third gear throughout the league and just just wait for, for them to be back to normal. So I think the Kerry hype meter is directly proportional to the Dublin hype meter and it feels that people have been sleeping on how good Dublin still are a little bit, which seems ridiculous to say, but uh, that, that's certainly his opinion. Uh, do you agree? Well, it's hard to disagree with someone who knows a lot more about football than I do, and he'll have seen uh, this Dublin team maybe at their best. That's kind of the whole point of the show. Uh, the whole point of this is that we get to disagree with other people. That's like, especially those who know way more than us. Yeah. That's but, kind of part of the joy of this. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. But I don't know. The, like, the reason why I asked him, obviously, is because he'll have prepared for those Dublin games down through the years, and we're kind of guessing as to like what the intensity actually is of, of going up against them or, or what is the best version of, of this Dublin team and, and when it was. Like we could maybe take a stab that 16-17 was the best version of, of this Dublin team and then others will say, well, look at how they, they creamed the opposition in 18 and, and in 2020 as well. So I, I, I just always find it hard to, to answer this question about Dublin. It, it is like sometimes their dominance can actually be surprising, which seems weird to say, but sometimes they just they, they just steamroller teams and we're like, why did we get into a position where we thought this might not happen? Like when it came to maybe at, maybe at times in the Leinster Championship even, we start to talk ourselves into an idea that they may not be 20-point winners in certain games. They're like, fever dreams though, right? Yeah. That, that, that is a fever dream based on no evidence. What we've seen with this Kerry side, apart from last year, is that they definitely have the accoutrements and the talent and the, uh, the brain power. And like they've come from the defensive mindset of the Fitzmaurice era. And clearly it looked like Peter Keane had gone back to that a little bit last year. We'll never know because really it's hard to know what, exactly what was going on in that one championship game that mattered. And then on top of that, they've layered on really excellent forwards who are coming into something of a peak. Like, this isn't a fever dream, I don't think. I think that, they, you know, there's a realistic reason and evidence to back up the notion that Kerry can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dublin. Yeah, absolutely. There is absolutely evidence there, 100%. Uh, it just depends on how good Dublin are or not. And if Dublin in third gear was a Dublin we saw in Thurles a month ago, <laughs> I think that spells trouble, to be quite honest, because I don't think Kerry were in third gear whatsoever. I think they were, they'd nudged up to fourth for a lot of that and, and maybe even slipped into fifth for a time in that third quarter. So that, that's the worry. And it all depends on, like, I, as, as much as you'd be like, 
yes, this Kerry team is good enough, which they seem to be, it does come down to, to the opponent they'll face in an All-Ireland final. And then there, there comes with all these, these, all this paranoia from last season as well, which uh, may be hard to escape or maybe is totally in, in the background. Like, I'm not sure if Fitzmaurice will go away with the, go along with your idea there. They've moved away from his defensive football because he'd probably say that they weren't overly defensive under him, except for maybe the 2014 All-Ireland. I'm sorry, I don't think they've moved away. I think they've, they've used that as the base and they've evolved. They're, like, they've added forwards to it who are at a higher level than the forwards that he was able to call on. Now, the forwards he were able to call on were pretty sensational at various stages along the way. So, I'm not saying that they were totally defensive, but they were they were ultra defensive, particularly that year against Donegal, for example. Like they definitely approached that game in, in a, like I mean, using James Dunhu in a, in a way that wasn't becoming of Theo Dunhu we'd seen all that all that year, for example, was one of those. Uh, I think against Cork in the Munster final that year, they were, there was this brilliant swash buckling performance that was right up there in any Munster final performance that they put in over the last decade when he had, as you say, like a great combination of two eras where you had Declan O'Sullivan and um, I know Colin Cooper was injured that year but in 2013 he had those two flying and then you had the new generation of Ganey and O'Donoghue who were who were outstanding from, from the off as well and he managed to, to, to mould those two generations together pretty quickly and uh, to become probably the, the second, third best team in the country around that time, even though it was clearly a team in, in transition. So, yeah, like, 100% uh, if, if you're judging it in, in isolation, that is this Kerry team good enough to win in All-Ireland? All things being equal, absolutely, yes. Okay. And you didn't uh, come away with just a more sense of realism. That's what we're going to no. get from uh, speaking with him for tomorrow. So that's coming on your way at around about 10 past nine this morning. It's 7.51. If you want to get in touch with us, 087 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. We're very excited to let you know that OTB Sports will be broadcasting full live commentary of all nine matches from the forthcoming British and Irish Lions Tour of South Africa. There's obviously eight games in South Africa and a game this Saturday afternoon when it is uh, the Lions, backboned by all of the Irish players against Japan, uh, uh, fever dream fantasy revenge tour uh, if that's what you're looking for that is your bag three o'clock on saturday afternoon brian o'driscoll and alan quinlan are going to be alongside neil tracy on commentary for the three test matches devon toner neve briggs and jack carty will be among the co-coms for the warm-up games and this saturday against japan andy dunn is going to be in the commentary box alongside neil for the three o'clock kickoff that'll be live on off the ball on news talk and our coverage will be brought to you in association with vodafone lead partner of the british and irish lions we're very excited about this we're doing a classic game club special with Brian O'Driscoll. It's going to air tomorrow evening uh, between 7 and 8 p.m. on Off the Ball on New Sock, and it is the second test from 2009. Now, I had forgotten we were doing this until after all the football last night, so I stayed up late to watch it. And uh, I don't know how you felt after that game on, but I was pretty. Like, I, I remembered, I hadn't watched it back since the actual game itself. And I remember at the time being somewhat appalled by it, mm. but I came away with it going, that might be the nastiest, mm. most horrible, most grotesque sports team that I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, Every uh, single aspect about them is, with the exception maybe of John de Villiers, who seems like a very nice man, who went off injured, but like almost no redeeming feature to them. Like Scott Berger, first minute of the game, putting his... 15 seconds in, and he's in the picking eye the eye Fitzgerald. out. He's literally got Luke Fitzgerald's eyeball on a string, and he's... Oh, I'm not going to eat you now, Luke. And they're like, oh, it's a yellow card. Maybe yellow? Not sure. Oh, yeah, give me yellow. Yeah, the assistant referee goes to uh, the main referee and is like, it's at least yellow. And he's like, understood, yellow card. <laughs> Rather than, like, conversation around, so is this, like, a red, do you think? Like, did you, did you see the, the finger go into the eye? Uh, like, I mean, moments later, then O'Driscoll then, uh, takes on Victor Matfield in, uh, in, in, a, in a nice little tussle. So there will be plenty of memories to get into in, in that one tomorrow night. Yeah, uh, absolutely. If you want to grim yourself out about, uh, about rugby and the, the state the game was in at that stage, but also if you want to be kind of uh, gloriously entertained the way that you would have been in the Roman Colosseum as the lion mauls the human being, then you need to uh, get a... It's on YouTube. 7.54 this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. I'm delighted to say Philippe Auclair is with us. Philippe, good morning to you. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you very much. Good morning to you too. So the, the group of death was nearly the group of death and ultimately all the teams who we expected to come through came through, but not in quite the 
route health that we might have anticipated. Where, where are France now, for example? What do you think about where they are? Uh, probably in a better place after last night's game than they were before uh, in some areas. Still uh, questions to be asked and uh, which are being asked in France about some of the uh, tactical choices, some of the personnel, but um, uh, I think more or less they are more or less where we expected them. It's not entirely working. Um, France has played perhaps two good halves, you could say. Um, I mean, one good game against uh, against Germany, certainly first half when they were competing, um, mastering things, and then managed the game extremely well. Against Portugal, it was rockier, uh, but that was expected. You know, Portugal had a much more aggressive team than the one they had selected for their first two games. Uh, obviously, there's a little bit of a of needle between the two nations, as you know. There's, there's a long history of rivalry between those two those two teams. Uh, last of which, of, of course, was the uh, 2016 final. And uh, and also Deschamps has been um, changed his tactical system for that game. Went from a 4-3-3 to a 4-2-3-1. Put Tolisso in a kind of false winger role, which didn't quite work. But all these reservations put aside, the fact is Benzema scored twice. And the fact is that Paul Pogba confirmed that he truly is one of the world's best midfielders, at least when he's got the French jersey on his shoulders. So uh, I think more reasons to be pretty optimistic, uh, apart from the fact that the, half of the French draw is pretty nightmarish, isn't it? But otherwise, I think satisfaction at the job, pretty well done. Can we tease out some of the, the issues around the, the tactical side of things in terms of the criticism mm -hmm. that Deschamps is facing? What are the issues and, and why is it not quite working at the moment? Well, I, I think when you look at the game against Portugal and you look at where the, uh, the threat was coming from France uh, and when you think of the amazing attacking potential that the team has, you'd be left a little bit frustrated at the lack of clear-cut chances created even against, you know, obviously a very good Portugal team. But by using so like somebody, somebody like Corentin Tolisso, who is a genuine midfielder, uh, as, as a kind of winger, uh, or as I said, full swinger, we call them in French, on the right-hand side, it means that on the, that, that particular side of, of the pitch was basically, um, well, we, we didn't create anything there. And I still think that we are trying to find a way to make the Mbappé, Griezmann, Benzema triangle work properly. In particular, for me, when it comes to Antoine Griezmann, who is a superb player, who showed it against uh, last night, but we are not creating enough chances. Um, even with such a, a, a wonderful array of attacking talent, and it's left to Paul Pogba, which he does very well, to have these long passes, which he does very well, and like the one which led to uh, Benzema's second, second goal, which is absolutely magnificent, by the way. But... It's a little bit, uh, you know, we're, we're waiting for more from Kylian Mbappe in terms of the end product. We're waiting for even more from Antoine Griezmann, whom I think plays a little bit too far back. I'm not the only person to think that. And honestly, the, the way that the French team is organized, was organized against Portugal, explains a, a good deal about that. I mean, this 4 3 one is perhaps not the right configuration. But, you know, it was a try. It worked. It could not have worked. Um, but the qualification was assured, of course. Some people would say that uh, it would have been better to finish in second place anyway. <laughs> so um, there are still, yes, uh, there are still areas in which uh, there is work to be done and, and progress to be made, certainly for France. It, it, the 4-2-3-1, Philippe, it may not get the best outcome for the team, but does it get the best out of Paul Pogba? I think it was pretty good in the 4-3-3 in the first two games. Sure. Yeah. And the other thing as well is that if you imagine, and I think uh, it is probably something we'll see more of as the tournament progresses, if you see in the role of a, um, the right winger, so to speak, of the right attacking midfielder, uh, somebody like Kingsley Common, uh, who came out and immediately had an impact, rather than Corta to so probably the system, I think, would be more efficient. But uh, France's 4-3-3 with either Rabiot, Tolisso, and Pogba and Kante is in some ways um, more balanced. And um, France actually created more with that, with that particular system. But uh, it, it's, it's a work in progress. And I think that um, uh, when it comes to, uh, I mean, the fact as well of having, sorry to come back on that, but on the right-hand side, the fact that Jules Koundé was actually selected ahead of Pavard to 
uh, create a threat on that right flank, which was had been thought beforehand uh, not to carry enough of this threat, and it didn't work. The relationship didn't work. So, if this is put in place and functions correctly, then you will see a France which is probably more uh, in tune with what Didier Deschamps is expecting. And I think that the one thing we have all got to say is that. They were a bit frustrating. They've been a bit frustrating at times. But the tempo has been a bit uh, pedestrian. But if you look at the, I would say the last uh, 30 minutes of the game against Portugal, uh, you, you would say you would think that uh, France is actually starting to uh, rev up mm. and going through the gears very, which is the way that Deschamps usually does it in tournaments. Okay, like that, that is the thing, isn't it? That the first game against. Uh, against Germany just felt really significant. You, you have to win your first game to put yourself into that comfortable position. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, did they go back into must-win territory again from next week, Philippe? So you'd expect them to, to get back into that mode of the first game? Yes, and uh, if you look at their opponent, um, in a way, I mean, it's not I mean, no, no disrespect to the Swiss. And, and this tournament has already proven several occasions that to talk about um, lesser teams uh, can be a bit dangerous. On the other hand, logic has been respected very often. And in this case, you would expect France to go past the Switzerland team, which has, I mean, I'm trying to remember the last time the Swiss beat the Le Bleu, uh, must have been quite a while ago in a, in a major tournament. Um, and um, you would imagine it's a perfect stepping stone for, for, for the quarterfinals, and then you can carry on this process. Afterwards, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, when I look at the at the draw, um, but yes, the the signs are good. The the, the team will be uh, reassured by by its performance last night. I don't think they will I, they will be super focused as they always are when it comes to meeting the Swiss. Uh, the, the France is not a team that makes the mistake of underestimating its opponents, like Germany, for example, has done. Um, and um, so yeah, I mean they're they're in a good place at the moment. And I must say, I'm feeling much more optimistic today than I felt when I first talked to you before the tournament started. What's the reason for the change in optimism? Because I thought this group was a horror and uh, I was uh, dreading that first game against Germany. I had always said that the game in Hungary would be extremely difficult and it proved to be, uh, if only because they were playing with genuinely 12 men, the Hungarians, and that after a whole year of COVID, playing in an arena full of 62,000 spectators would, would be quite a challenge, and it proved to be quite a challenge. And I thought the game against Germany could go wrong, and the games against Hungary could go wrong. So you can imagine what my thoughts were, yeah. that if, if after two games we're in a bad place, then all the criticism that people are waiting to unleash at the French back home uh, w will be unleashed. And people will say, you shouldn't have been taking Benzema out of the tournament, and you should have put Giroud, and you shouldn't have done this, and you shouldn't have done that. And uh, in this case, I think yesterday's game as well, this is another reason why I feel optimistic, is that yesterday's game and, and Benzema's double uh, will have uh, quietened uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of apprehensions and a lot of people. Even if I have to say, and I, I hold my hand up here, that the uh, penalty which gave Benzema's first goal after five years was an absolute farce, but that's a different matter altogether. We'll take it. The uh, the form of Kylian Mbappe is uh, something that obviously the whole world is very interested in. Pre-tournament, we were wondering if this was going to be him stealing the tournament and putting the, the team on his back. It hasn't quite happened like that. And, and you, no. you've certainly been talking about this very consistently, about just there's something a little bit missing at the moment from the unburdened and the, the free-flowing Kylian Mbappe that we had maybe anticipated. Yeah, and actually, particularly last night, was not particularly good, was he, in a big, big game. Um, and um, I, 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 I do think, and I know that many people are obsessed about taxis and stats and things telling me that it's not the case, but I do think that what's happening out of the field, of the field, is as important as what is happening on the field. And you can see it with Harry Kane as well. Players who, whose future is in the balance, especially at a time like now, always have a problem focusing 100% in tournaments, always. And not consciously. I mean, Kylian Mbappe, when he's there, listening to the Marseillaise or seeing the Marseillaise, is not thinking, should I stay at Paris Saint-Germain <laughs> or go? That's not the way it happens. It's just the fact that 
they are not completely 100% engaged all of the time with what is happening, and, and uh, it can show. There is also a, an element of he playing with PSG as, as Kylian Mbappe is not the ideal preparation for playing with France in an international tournament. Um, the level of opposition that Mbappe faces week in, week out, except in the Champions League, is quite poor. Uh, he doesn't have to overstretch himself. Uh, also, he's working next to Neymar. It's a very strange, it's like a bit of a circus act at, at, at times, if I'm absolutely honest. But suddenly he's in this setup which is completely different um, and which is not necessarily geared towards making him th the focal man. But he's, he's so good, he's so smart, so intelligent, that I think it's another of those cases where you will see him grow through the tournament. I mean, remember in 2018, it's only as the tournament grew, I mean, progressed, that we started to see the real Kylian Mbappe. And actually, you would, you would say he kept the best for last. And it perhaps has to do with his style of play, it perhaps the way we haven't been very um, positive. If you look against um, Germany, we did... All that was needed, scored a goal and basically closed our shop, shut up shop. Uh, against the Hungarians, we created loads of chances against uh, an opponent which we were expected to beat quite easily, but then we were shaken a bit. Uh, and against Portugal, the, the main axis was not the, um, we'd say, for example, Luca Arnaudeschi and Mbappé, or it, it was Pogba Benzema. Uh, and, and, we haven't played to his strength yet. He hasn't had the space either in which to exploit his space fully, uh, apart from a couple of occasions against Germany, perhaps. So all of these reasons, plus the fact that there is a certain amount of uh, unease, I wouldn't say turmoil, but unease about his future, explains why, or is an attempt at explaining, why we haven't seen the Kylian Mbappe we all know is there uh, in this player. But we'll probably see him later on in the tournament. That's the way it goes with him. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, the the other big storyline from last night, Philippe, is the the setting up of a of a classic in the last sixteen. So how re <laughs> how ready are you for four or five days straight of England versus Germany build up? Um, I know where the off button is on my television, <laughs> uh, so I'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> but it will be unbearable. It will be unbearable. Um, if you if you think uh, how the uh, build up to the England Scotland game was. I was bad enough. Uh, now, uh, to the England-Germany game, my goodness. Uh, is it five days, you've said? Oh, my goodness, that's a long time. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it's, it's genuinely two teams that have no idea what they are and what they can be. So, and, and, and we're looking at every game uh, of, of their tournament for a kind of response. And Germany was... Bad, brilliant, really bad. Brilliant next time? We don't know. England is uh, very good, not so good, mediocre, quite good, you know, within the same games. Yeah. So we have no idea what's going to happen. But yes, it's the, uh, the build-up is going to be interesting, especially in the current climate in, in Britain at the moment. Well, that's the thing. Like we, so this game was supposed to be in Dublin, and it could have been uh, Germany versus England with the... Brexit backstop and the DUP issues all playing out on the streets of, of Dublin with the, uh, the Irish guards yes. kind of, you know, daring the English hooligans to go. I mean, look, uh, we, we certainly are thinking about what the alternative universe might have been uh, in that case. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, are, are we better off in the new configuration? I'm not too sure. The fact that it's still the amount of, of people who can go to the game at Wembley at the quarterfinals, it's, uh, you know, it does uh, change things uh, uh, somewhat uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, actually, I say, yeah, I say Wembley. Yes, it is Wembley. Sorry, I, I get, I'm still trying to work out this, this draw. Uh, but the fact is Wembley, we're going to have, what, 22,000 um, inside because the, the number of spectators is only up from the semis onwards. So... Uh, uh, it's going to be yes. It's going to be a long, long few days. And I don't, I don't necessarily think it's going to be that bad in the streets or in the uh, between the between the fans. 
it's it's more in the media that the battle is going to be to be fought, and uh, in the British media, I should say, much more than in the German media. Um, I'm not looking forward to that. That's the least I can say. Mm. It's interesting as well, Philippe, that we thought that throughout this tournament, when it came to some of the off the pitch discussions, everything would have revolved around taking the knee and over the last couple of days things have changed considerably with the UEFA barring of the, the rainbow lights on, on the, yeah. the stadium in Munich. Obviously it was just amazing to see Goretzka's celebration last night with, with the love heart and obviously he's been so well spoken about his role as a sports person over the years on, on a range of topics from, from race to, to sexuality and a, and a whole other a bunch of things as well. This was he's kind also of, come with a quote of the tournament. Say that again? He's also come with a quote of the tournament. Which is? Uh, which is when Germany, uh, which is, it's great to be in a country of uh, 82 million potential national team selectors than 82 million virologists. Yes. <laughs> which is utterly brilliant. But he's Islam Goretzka, he's, uh, he's a superstar. And a kind of a, a brilliant sort of slap in the face to UEFA as well, that celebration last night? Yeah, absolutely. Well deserved. Bravo. Um, the, the worst own goal that UEFA have, uh, could have possibly have scored. I think the time when UEFA were everybody's darlings after what um, their resistance, or so called resistance to the Super League project, is now lost in the mists of time. They've managed to absolutely ruin everything uh, uh, with great virtuosity, I must say. Uh, their, their statement yesterday, in which they attempted to explain their decision. Uh, not to uh, um, say yes to the request of the city of Munich uh, was uh, a masterpiece of, of contradictions because they basically said that on one hand we acknowledge the fact that uh, the rainbow uh, illumination would not be a political gesture. I mean, we could discuss that. I personally think it's a political gesture, but a good political gesture, but that's a different matter altogether. Uh, but we recognize it's not a political gesture, but our decision was political. You think, well, hold on a minute, so you're telling us that we can't do this because it could be deemed as political, but you've taken a political decision to placate the regime of, of Orban. Um, and actually, uh, in Hungary, are you aware of the fact, UEFA, that a, a large proportion of people do not agree with the anti-LGBT policies of Mr. Orban? Are you aware of that? No, they're not, obviously. So it's a massive own goal. Uh, scored by UEFA, and in a way, I suppose, sometimes you've got, again, to be the optimist rather than the pessimist, and say that the very stupidity of, of their actions will have uh, put the spotlight even more firmly on the issue that illuminating the stadium in rainbow colors uh, was about. So they've succeeded, so maybe thank you. I mean, the, as you said, the, the Goretzka gesture, which has been shown all over the world, will probably have an even bigger, bigger impact because there was nothing like we're going to, uh, in a way, follow uh, a trend or, or respect a movement which is shared by everybody. No, this was very much, I am telling you, you guys, that this is right. And that is much, much more powerful. In a way, that's true. Probably most of the world wasn't paying attention. We should have been paying more attention to what was going on in Hungary. All of a sudden, far more people are galvanized yes. to try and support the LGBTQ plus community in Hungary and are exercised about this. And, and you know, maybe, it's the, maybe that's the impact that we all needed, a little bit of a jolt that we needed. But perhaps, and, um, and the fact as well is that the people in, in Hungary who are fighting against uh, the imposition of those draconian rules and, and discrimination uh, will have been heartened by the response to that. And um, that, that is also a, a plus. So again, um, it might be, uh, we say, un mal pour un bien, uh, something we say in French, something bad, but when it in the end produces good. And, um, you know, let's hope we take it from there. Yeah, Philippe, as ever, merci beaucoup. De rien. Philippe Auclair there, and uh, getting a lot of love in our comments at the moment. Uh, Will says, Philippe, one of the best. Auclair knows his stuff, one of the best around. Um, UEFA are some disgrace, lads. LGBT rights for the win, says New Holland. Uh, POC says, both England and Germany have brittle defences. England have shored this up by being most negative. Muller is, however, finding a bit of form in front of goal. Um, is, is, it, is it destined, is it writ, that Thomas Muller is going to be the one that slays England at the weekend? I don't know. Yeah, uh, potentially. Uh
like I, did all, all this, did this, did this noise around England, like it's, it is incredible, really. And it, you have to say that when they eventually get over the line, it will be uh, an added achievement because of all of that. So when we just think about what the next couple of days are going to, to, to be like, it's next Tuesday actually. So you've got a whole weekend where you're watching games and you're just thinking about England, Germany. Your your eyes are on. Italy, Austria, but really, you're thinking about England against Germany, and that that goes for for everyone. It's it, like it's it's just it's going to be pure theatre. Five o'clock next Tuesday, regardless of what happens. If it's a born at all draw, then we get tantalisingly close to penalty shootout. Mm. Whether whereas if it's a classic, then it's a classic, and we win. So no matter what happens, five o'clock next Tuesday, uh, football is the winner. OTBM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It's 15 minutes past eight. James Scal is standing by. We're going to talk to him about the hurling championship. We'll also bring you through the newspaper headlines right after these. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moore. James Gilbert down on the sideline, you know, and I just go. I said, Gilly, there's a goal on here. I said, I'm going up to these boys. So I ran up to John Morrison and I just got Morrison, I get a goal here if you put me on, right? Oh, cocky, cocky little 21-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> two boys said, this book is daft enough probably to actually do this stuff. So, on I go, goal. You can see me pointing out to the boys that I'm running back. I was moving. <laughs> Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online, then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. First up, a Go Loud original from News Talk. Get all the news you need to start your day with First Up, the podcast that brings you stories, analysis and interviews with the top newsmakers. First Up, available each weekday morning from 7am on Go Loud. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. Why not check out the Boyle Sports betting app for a full range of markets on shots on target, assists, passes and more on every match of the Euros, all powered by Opta. Rated four and a half stars on the App Store, you'll find all our latest odds and offers for the Euros. So remind us where to go, Stevie G. Boyle Sports, this is betting. 18 plus bet responsibly, gamblingcare.ie. OTB. AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Right, we can run you through the uh, newspaper headlines this morning. We'll start with otbsports.com. Goretzka sends clear message as Germany dump Hungary out of Euros, so he's making the uh, love sign in the general direction of the uh, Hungarian fans. And there's a brilliant picture from the other side where there's three black T-shirted Hungary fans who are looking very depressed as uh, he runs towards them celebrating. Euro 2020 permutations, who plays who in the last 16? I mean, do we do we talk enough about the fact that Ukraine are still in the tournament? <laughs> did we did we talk enough about this? Yeah. Did you know that? Uh, no, I'm only joking. Uh, like, I mean, it's yeah. So according to Mark, anyway. If they, if, and according to the data that I have at my availability here, it looks it's like it's Sweden. List. Yeah. Uh, which is a fixture list. Yeah. I mean, if you're a Sweden, right? If you're a Sweden. So you've got to be. You've got to play Ukraine, who are rubbish. They were absolutely rubbish so far, right? And then you play the winners of England Germany for a place. In the final? In the semi final. In, in the semi final. Se yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the semi finals are, are, are all known as well. Of course they are. With revenge at, at stake for, for the Swedes after 2018 as well. Like, and uh, sorry. And not in Wembley. If is you, a key thing as well, the quarter final. If, no, it's in Rome. If you make that, uh, and if you win that game, it's like the Dutch or the Czechs or the Welsh or the Danes. Yeah. Sweden, Denmark semi-final is not off the cars here at all. I know on BBC they were talking about the possibility of an England-Wales semi-final, but like everybody's looking at that semi-finals going, hmm, Czech Republic versus Ukraine, semi-final, thanks very much. That's what the Czechs and Ukrainians are thinking. And like, weird things happen in tournaments. You can nil-nil your way now all the way to the, to the title. Uh, I think that's what a lot of people forgot uh, last night as well when people were talking about England getting on the easy side of the draw. Like, Germany probably looked at that side of the draw last night, which includes England, and said that's the easy side of the draw. Like people, I think, would prefer to play them than Belgium and Italy and France and maybe even Portugal at, at, at the moment. So, uh, like, the, I wouldn't be 
too, I wouldn't be overly with you on the whole Ukraine thing. Like, I mean, obviously they, they, they're not in the top 10 teams in this tournament, but like they were pretty good the first night against the Netherlands, got their win, and here they are in the, in the knockout stages, a couple of good attackers, and Shevchenko hasn't played good attacking football. I think Sweden and Ukraine could actually be one of the, one of the better games, actually, in the, in the last 16, because they're, there's so much at stake for them both. To get into a quarterfinal in this tournament would be massive. Was it Des Curran pointed out? I'm not sure, it could have been somebody else that uh, it's long forgotten now, but it was Shevchenko's um, Kiev side who were beaten by the odd goal in seven by Bayern Munich in the 99 semi final. I had completely forgotten that. Uh, and so uh, that would have been how, how history would have been different. Uh, the London Times there, it's the Germans next. That's the picture of uh, Goretzka with his um, heart in the general direction of the United landing 77 million Jadon Sancho not good enough for this England team at the moment but good enough to be a 77 million pound player when your cluck's in this is the back page headline on the mirror Kilkenny claims Blue's most decorated man is making a timely return so he's looking for his 600th uh, Leinster medal this year Stephen Cluckson has returned to training according to Kieran Kilkenny amid mounting speculation, so that, that would suggest he's actually back at training and good to go. Uh, Dutch and go is the back page headline on the star. Um, Cluxon's training comeback and United an 85 million bid for Sancho. There are the stories there. So they're all essentially the same. London calling for the Germans. Uh, London Calling is the front page headline on the Mail and of course also on the Examiner this morning. Uh, Cluxton back in training with the Dubs, says the Irish Independent. And there's a really interesting story here from Roy O'Connor. It says, Lions tour heading for a region of catastrophe. The Lions are heading to a region on the cusp of a COVID-19 catastrophe as South Africa braces itself for its third wave of the pandemic. A leading medic has warned that the situation in the Guateng province, which includes Johannesburg, where Gatlin squad will arrive and play their first four matches, is getting more and more worrying by the day. After 10,800 new cases were reported in the region yesterday, 6,000 patients are in hospital. And then, uh, as you heard last night on Off the Ball on News Talk, it is uh, Killian O'Connor is the headline in your time of the morning. James Horne admits he's planning without Killian O'Connor for the 2021 Championship. He told Joe last night that uh, he's, he's out for the foreseeable, so it seems pretty serious. And then the front page headline of The Guardian today, police officer convicted of footballers manslaughter and it's a picture of Daly and Atkinson as I definitely remember him in that cool old villa top with the laces when the laces were all the thing and uh, what a vital force of nature Daly and Atkinson was as a footballer and what a horrific way it was for him to die um, he was tasered for 33 seconds and kicked in the head by PC Benjamin Monk who yesterday was convicted of his manslaughter the first British police officer in 35 years to be convicted of manslaughter while on duty. So a horrific end to Dalian Atkinson's life and uh, football fans will remember an scored an incredible goal against Wimbledon. Look it up, check it out on YouTube and hopefully that's how people are going to remember Dalian Atkinson in the future. Yeah, um, just a, a couple of other things to, to go through this morning. The um, Leon Goretzka thing is, is interesting because pe people are kind of like uh, digging back into Leon Goretzka being uh, just a really top guy over the, the, the past 12 hours or so. Uh, there's like a, a couple of various different uh, elements to this. Uh, Philip Lamb, in his autobiography uh, recently, uh, spoke about the idea of a, a current footballer coming out uh, as gay and said that there is a lack of acceptance in the world of football and in society in general. He talked about Thomas Hitzelberger, who uh, obviously uh, announced uh, his sexuality after playing. And I, I guess we're, we're talking about this in the context of the NFL as well this week. And Lamb said it was prudent of him to do so. And then Goretzka kind of came out around that time and said, I would encourage everyone to ensure them of my support and still understand that they don't dare. My hope is that players will come out in my active career as well. When it comes to such issues, our society is often much more advanced than sport. And last year then, there was a, a situation where he urged his Twitter followers to, to follow the official account of the Auschwitz concentration camp memorial and had this quote where he said, Fritz Walter once said that all national players are foreign ministers in shorts. I think the saying is very good. We players should use the great attention we get to raise awareness of such issues. It was sort of fitting that he was the man who found himself with the, the winning goal for Germany last night to, to deliver such a celebration on a night when we had a protester on the pitch, of course, who, who ran on with the, the rainbow flag, which, of course, we weren't shown on television. Uh, 
but if it was uh, obviously there's a, a bit, bit of a contradiction there given that we, we saw the Christian Eriksen thing in, in, in uh, clear colour a couple of weeks ago but this protest was airbrushed from, from our TVs but obviously picked up on social media and uh, went fairly viral to say the least last night. Yeah, the uh, Viva was lit up last night to celebrate Pride. These pictures here have been doing the rounds, you can see them there. Uh, Viva also backing the hashtag Lace Up With Pride campaign to show solidarity with the LGBT plus community. They, you can buy the laces, they're four quid in Intersport Alvarez and it supports the Belong to Youth Services who provide support to LGBT plus young people in Ireland and it's a campaign that we're totally happy to support and get behind. You can see our laces in the corner there, you can there, yeah, over our shoulder here. So that's the crack with that. A reminder, OTBM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, put your best face forward with new and improved razors. It is time for us to turn our attention to hurling. I'm delighted to welcome James Scale back to the show. James, the week of a championship like this where it's beginning to get serious, the training has all been done. What's it actually like to be involved in a camp where you're hurtling towards the championship and things are getting real? How are you guys? Um, it's very exciting. Um, I, use, I know I'm a, I'm a country by at heart here, but it's a bit like when you let cattle out of a shed at winter. They go jumping or leaping. It's kind of the way it is in, <laughs> in training, let's say, in the last week or so, um, just in, in preparation, because everything has culminated this week. Um, so when you, you get your winter programs back in, in, in a standard year, should I say, in October and November, and you start in at the gym and you're running in the dirty nights, uh, it's pouring rain down top of you, and you're, you're, you're basically miserable. All that's in your head is the championship week. We say that keeps you going as such. And I suppose guys have been looking in one sense uh, that, that they're, they're, the league has been so close to the championship this year. So they've had a run of games prior to the championship and have a good bit of practice. Um, but everyone's excited, like everyone's looking forward. There's this touch of nervousness too. Like you obviously have guys who are guaranteed to start on the team. You know, most teams will probably have uh, maybe 10, 11 guaranteed starters. And there's probably eight or nine guys who are vying for the last four positions. So those guys are kind of nervous, trying to do everything right. They're looking over at managers to see you. They're looking at them. They're waiting to see you. They're going to come over and talk to them for a second to, to, to announce that they're going to be on the team. So there's a touch of nervousness for some, but mostly excitement for most. Uh, the the Presumably, from a, a, a player's perspective, there's not really much you can do to alter the manager's thinking at this point. It, it always seems to me like managers have a bit of confirmation bias going on and they, they need to have had in their head most of the big decisions made a couple <clears> of weeks back. And yet, at the same time, they need to keep everybody on their toes to the point where everybody believes they still have a chance. Yeah, and that, that's that's the issue as well, like that some managers would say, some are better than others, should I say, at that. And in my experience, that has been the case, whereby you know, their, their man management skills have been impeccable, and they've been able to keep the 30, 35 guys all in sync and go in the same direction without creating any much of a division between, let's say, the starters and, and the guys who are on the fringes. And let's say when man management is not going well, you can nearly sometimes see clicks creating uh, where starters would, would nearly kind of form groups of their own and say that's a that's a terrible terrible envir environment to be involved in but like if a team is going to be successful like you've got to prepare well play well and get a bit of luck so if you're not preparing well which is something you do most um because of kind of i suppose a bad, let's, let's say a bad relation or a bad vibe from management to players and say that's that's detrimental to a team and i think i said from my own experience let's say you could always get a vibe you know you'd get it weeks out like you'd know there'd be a versus b uh, challenge games in inside and training like four or five weeks out from from championship games so you'd know how the manager or management team should i say were thinking um you'd know even by the level of interaction you know so if the manager is kind of i'll say stonewall you a bit somewhat <laughs> I, I say that loosely you know stonewall you a bit some, somewhat um you can nearly guess that you're not going to be involved terribly um, but the real settler is, is the a versus b game so like those games go right up to a week before championship and generally the last week the a team is put out entirely to get a to get a sense of I suppose, uh, a bit of a game together, get a bit of feeling together, let's say, in, in pattern of playing and whatnot. So it's um, it's a funny one for managers. Like I, it, I think it's very difficult to actually physically manage because every player that goes into a county team um, is obviously the best player in their club. There's no doubt about that. So they, they'll have been used to being the, the number one guy or girl in their club for, for, for many years, let's say, underage level, up into senior. And every time they go back to their club, they're champions, they're the main person. When they come into a county environment, then... You, they don't know where they are in the pecking order. So that's a bit hard to take from a mental perspective for the player um, to, to kind of transition from, from being top dog in the club to kind of uh, one of the pack in the, in the county team, let's say. And other players take that differently. I've seen guys who have walked out, you know, in years previous, let's say, when they haven't been on a, a start in 15 or 26 because they thought themselves uh, to be higher in the room. You know, so it's, it's a tentative one for managers. But I think most managers nowadays, they're, they're not nearly, from what I see, the top tier managers, they're, 
they're more man managers, let's say. I know Bill Gates said before, let's say, the secret to good business is delegation. And that's what managers seem to have done, let's say, when you look at the, the Jim Gavins and the, and the John Kiley's, they have a team around them, let's say, to manage everything, or they then manage the group as such. So um, I think that's kind of transition out of the whole setup now at the minute, and, and players and management alike are becoming more interaction from a, from a person perspective as opposed to a sporting perspective. If we get stuck into some of the games then that will get the championship underway this weekend, James. Mm -hmm. If we start with Leinster, Dublin against Antrim, 3 o'clock on Saturday, Leash against Wexford at 6 o'clock on Saturday. We touch on Wexford there, you talk about the, the power of delegation. Do you think Davy Fitz has the, the art of delegation off to a tee yet? <laughs> I did say top level managers, didn't I? <laughs> um, so, no, I wouldn't put, I, that, I don't think that delegation has been, has been, uh, is, it has really been, how do I say? I, I, it's tricky on that one to say. I've had Davy Fitz in college, don't get me wrong, to say, and delegation wouldn't be one of the words that he'd have, you know, I'll put that with you. Um, Wexford are a tricky one, guys. I look at Wexford and, like, they're a team, let's say, they're kind of, you know, their class is the top class team. I wouldn't have them in the top four or five. I would always view them as being a team that are, are they, they nearly have enough, but they don't have enough, you know. They're, they're forward units, say, they don't score enough, let's say, the guys there. I don't think they have the, the quality up front. They have fantastic athleticism, there's no question about that. They have fantastic fitness, but every team across the board has that. So you go to any team, let's say, at top level, they're all going to be as fit as each other, and predominantly they'll be as strong as each other. But what really breaks it down, then, let's say, is obviously tactical, and then the actual skill of the hurler you have, and the actual hurling ability. And I look at Wexford, I, I just don't see they have enough. Like, in the last four championship games that Wexford has played Galway, you know, they've been beaten by an average of eight points, and have only scored 17 points at the tops of that. So I just wonder where, where the scores are going to come from, you know? And like in in those four same games, like Galway has scored, I think 27, 29 points in two others. So their defence offers a bit of leakage too as well. And I just don't see their defence holding out top level forward lines, and I don't see the forwards you know, taking down top level back lines. So I, I, I Wexford and Leash, I think they'll come through Leash. Obviously, um, you know, not trying to diminish diminish Leash's capabilities, but I think when they they come up against Kilkenny then in the, in, in the semi final, that could be dangerous for them. Was the, the, the forwards, uh, the, the firepower in the forwards not an issue in, in 2019 or, or how did they manage to get so close then? That's a, that's a straight, I, I just think, um, you know, I think momentum is a, is a big thing in hurling too, guys. Like uh, that, that game in 2019 with Galway, they drew uh, 16 points apiece, I believe. And I just think Galway were suffering from a hangover from the two years previous, both mental and physical, you know. So they got a bit of a run. They got through the group by the by, by score difference, essentially, with a last, last spin a point against Kilkenny. And they just got a, just got a, they got a good draw. Do you know what I mean? And they should have beaten Tipperary, let's say, when they were a man up, but they didn't. You know what I mean? That's the size. Like Tipperary had a man down, let's say, when John McGregor got the line, and you know they didn't finish off Tipperary when they had them there. Do you know what I mean? When they had them there, and like the good teams, I, if if you put in 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 and that year, let's say, if you put in most teams, I should say, against Tipperary when a man down, they were going to come through. You know, um, I just don't, I just don't think they have it. I'm not not trying to be dismissive or negative towards them in any way, shape, or form. I played them enough times to see. That, that their, their passion, their game style is kind of repetitive, if I'm honest. I know David Fitz said last year after the semi final, the Leinster semi final, that he tried, they tried, should I say, five different formations. I saw one formation, maybe two. So I don't know where they're getting these formations out of. They didn't work. You know, they were beaten by nine points or seven, seven, nine points, yeah. So I'm not sure where, you know, where all the tactical knowledge, like where, where they say, do they think they're, they're more tactically ahead of people than they, than they actually are, you know? Um, so I know I'm being, it sounds I'm being very negative towards Wexford being dismissive, but look. No, I mean, so that's the whole point. We've got to try and establish where the, the tiers are at this stage. If you were in charge of Wexford, like with this group of players, or if is there anybody out there who could do things differently with this group of players and catapult them into that top tier? Yeah, well, you're looking at the best coaches, aren't you? Like, you're looking at what Paul Knurk has done with Clare. You're looking at what he's now done with Limerick. You know, he's, he's transformed a team, let's say, who have... Who have been there, they almost there, but not quite there, let's say, and brought an Ireland to them both, you know. Like so he's the kind of person who come in with a serious air of positivity and no off the field baggage. You know, that's a key thing as well. Because I I, I mentioned a few minutes ago about prepare well, play well, get a bit of luck. The preparation for Wexford has been staggered in in, in my opinion, let's say there they've been there've been too many highlights or lowlights, should I say, in the public eye with regard to off the field activities and on the field or on the sidelines, should I say, activities. Um and they just they don't need that distraction, do you know what I mean? And like I've I've been in in the dressing rooms with David Fitz like and it's 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 an intense place you know what I mean it's it's quite a how would I put this lightly it's quite a hyper dressing room I, I put it that with you um so the concentration levels could be they could be focused elsewhere if you, if you, if you get me um 
I, I'd be looking at like a Corkin type person who'd be really good, really genuine. Like they brought in Niall Corkin, who was a good hurling man as well, a Galway guy who spent a lot of time in Dublin. He'd have a good hurling knowledge, but I don't know how much of an influence he's allowed to have there, should I say. Um, but I, I do think as well, this possibly could be, in my opinion, the last year for Davy. I think there's going to be a change coming this year because like they've had relatively minor success. Uh, they got a Leicester Championship, which is, which is great. But I think that, that that county now is looking for more, especially when you see budgetary figures, what's been implied into the team. Okay, that's that's all really interesting because, uh, like, I guess last year, if if what happened last year happens again this year, then that makes obvious sense. If if they get back to the level they were at, where they're in an All Ireland semi final and the game is in the melting pot, again it'd be interesting to see how if the if the group has learned how to manage their way through that. Um, so if they're short of being contenders, is anybody close to the Limerick team at the moment? Are Tip and Galway? The obvious ones who are there? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Chip and Galway. My my rankings, my rankings for all for all they count for. Uh, Limerick are a clear number one. Um, the, the, they have a degree of separation from the rest of the pack at the moment, and I think it's been well publicised about all they do well and they do very little not well. Um, then I think I have Galway number two, and then I have a split between Tipperary and Kilkenny as number as giant number three. I can't separate either or. Uh, the game, whatever way a game goes on a certain day could, could separate those by a point or, or two. Um, and then after that, then you've got, again, and not to be dismissive, you've got the rest. Um, you've got Clare, Cork, Waterford in a pack, and then Wexford, as that'll say, with Dublin com coming after. You know, it's a difficult one. Um, I just think that you're looking at where Limerick stand right now. I'm not going to quite say they're, they're, they're where Kilkenny were in the mid 2000s or, or, or late 10s, say, but they're not too far away from it, to be honest with you. They haven't got quite the dominance. Um, that Kilkenny have had. But although, if you look at the names in the cups over the last couple of years, Limerick have been, have been, I suppose, shoving everyone out of the way. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a different type of championship this year. I think Limerick, uh, what they've done is this has been the same thing over the last couple of years, albeit very effective. But I, I just see maybe there's going to be a, a greater challenge to Limerick. Like they won't be winning Ireland final this year by 11 points like they did last year. Um, it'll go down to the wire big time. And I think that you've got the likes of Galway and Tip Kilkenny who are going to challenge the most. Just got a text in here, James, comparing uh, the eras of, of Davy Fitz to Jose Mourinho, where almost after a couple of years, things start to, I don't know, grind down or, or, or maybe the, the level of early success isn't replicated. Is, is, that, is that a legit comparison, do you think? Is, is there something that you've seen that, that after a little period of time, the things maybe aren't as good or as fresh as they were in those opening couple of seasons? Yeah, like I, I, modernization, I think, you know, my time with Davy was back in 2000 and Seven, we won the Fitzgibbon Cup with LIT. So you're talking 14, 15 seasons ago. And I th he's doing this, it looks to be, let's say, on the field, right? And, this, and technically speaking, doing the same things now as what was done back then in the college term, college times. Um, and I do I do agree that whoever checks in there has, is onto something as well because Mourinho, uh, he came out of the blue, let's say, um, not, he no, didn't have the best playing career, should I say, but then just blew up with Porto. And then he's, he got such a massive run of, run of success. And if you would just disregard the water final, let's say, for Davy in 2008 with their hammer by Kilkenny and go after that, let's say, it culminated in him being successful with, with Clare and then kind of having a great influence at Wexford. And, you know, sometimes a change is good as a break. So, like, when, when, when he went down to Wexford, that, that change kind of rejuvenated everyone at Wexford and created an air of kind of positivity. And that culminated in, in, in for me, the peak being the Leinster Championship, you know, two years ago. And I don't think they, they will they have reached similar heights. Obviously they haven't reached similar heights from regards to everywhere, but off the field and on the field, I don't think they're the where they need to be to challenge the top three or four. And I think that as, as I said to you, I I'm going back, I think this could be the last year uh David is in Wexford and I'm calling it now. I think it will be in Dublin next year. Right. Well that'll be pretty interesting. because uh, the mm -hmm. Dubs obviously just beat Galway last night in the yeah. under twenties, and that was a Galway team absolutely festooned with all Ireland winners. Uh, stacked is what the, that, that goal team was stacked. It was uh, very disappointing, very very disappointing. You know, um, like I'm not just saying because we, we lost them. It's, it was a Leinster finalist, uh, but it was, you know, I thought it was a good route if I'm honest to get to a to an Ireland final, especially after taking Don Kilkenny uh, last year. Um, it was surprising, you know. I, I thought we were very, we were very wasteful. You know what I mean? Um, like from from a, an individual basis. I know individuals come for three, if all if they on a team basis, but individual basis. We have outstanding holders in that team, especially in our forward unit, and we just didn't score enough. Like we were quite wasteful in front of goals. We had three clear cut goal opportunities that were, you know, denied by a good save or just wrong decisions. You know, and like I think Dublin needed that game too. They had a, a kind of a, 
a stuttering league have been if, if you if you like to go into a game against Navan now whereby they need a bit of positivity. Like Matty hasn't had the, the best league or championship game in the last 18 months. Um so with those 20 guys coming back in now and is and they're saying well done instead of hard luck. So it's good for the vibe in the team as well and just adds more positivity to the whole thing. Um whereas with with Galway, the good thing is I don't think there's too many guys on the senior panel. I know Derek and Gold and PJ at, at full back, let's say, but I I think the, the Galway team is seasoned enough, let's say, to just override that result and move on to senior senior championship. Can I go back to one thing there? You were saying if uh, so, if Paul Knark was to leave for whatever reason, and you know, again, this is idle speculation, but if he was uh, to take over a team like Wexford, are the raw materials there in Wexford or indeed any of the other counties at the moment with the right coaching to, to put the challenge up to Limerick? Bearing in mind you've compared Limerick to the great Kilkenny team, which is considered to be the greatest team of the mm -hmm. modern era, like so, do you know, I know they're not there yet, is what you said. And that it will be closer this year. Is is coaching capable of making that much of a difference that almost any of those top teams in the right hands could put it up to Limerick on an All Ireland final or semi final day? Yeah, I just think he's like now. Don't get me wrong. I've I've never met Paul Knock. I've never been part of his training session. I've just spoken to guys who have been within the setup and who speak rave reviews about him. Let's say, and they would give me snippets of things he does. He says drills. He operates and the way he the way he operates on a personal level with people. Um, and now when I'm saying Paul Knurk, I'm, I'm including the whole management team as well in that. Um, but I, if you consider, go back a couple of years ago, um, would you have thought, I mean this respectfully, would you have thought the Morrissey's or Garage Hegarty would have reached the heights they have? Even Graham Mulcahy, who I'd be friendly with, and he'd be my age, Graham Mulcahy didn't have the, he didn't set the world alight in his first, let's say, seven, eight years of inter-county hurling. And then he exploded. He exploded under Paul Knurk and got an All-Star, you know, when they won their Ireland. So I do think coaching has a huge, huge part to play. And like I've watched Limerick, some of the Limerick guys in club games, let's say on on television last year, we're lucky enough to see them, and they didn't stand out. You know, some of them didn't they didn't stand out. Um, they didn't stand out in a way that you'd see PJ with Bally Hale or you'd see Cahill Manning with the Hasbro. They just didn't stand out that way. And I just think it's all part of, you know, the, the the group, the setting, the way they set up tactically. And I think so. If you had Paul Knurk and you brought him down to Wexford, I think there's great tangibles there. Like I said, they've got great quality player. Like an, an individual, but that's, that's why I said at the start of the conversation, their backs unit and their forwards unit aren't firing each for each other. Now, I just think that if, if someone went in with a new voice and they change things up a small bit and give a different perspective, maybe more a more modern perspective, that Wexford could turn it around. If, like they, ha they have the tangibles there, they have they have the finance, you know, they have the facility. So, like, like if if in a if in a mad world that he did go down, he would make a huge difference to Wexford. And again, like from a bookie's perspective, Wexford would go from number seven eight up to you know four three straight away that, right. that's just the, that's, that's the influence i believe the canuck would have right. a canuck -like person that's really interesting there's one last thing i wanted to, to get your thoughts on um that we're always interested in trends and trends in the game some suggestion in, in various places recently that maybe giving five points for a goal might change the the way that the game is being played at the moment because we're seeing such high high scores uh, in terms of the points being scored I, i'm not even asking about that really but is the trend is it is there anything that might change the trend back to teams being goal hungry? Hmm. Yeah, like I, I do think if you incentivize teams to go for like if, even if you raise it to four or five, five points, yeah, you're putting putting more pressure on the goalie first of all. But um, we, I think we do have to do something, something, guys, because like I just did a bit of research there over the last week on on, on the whole points situation. Like in the last five of Ireland finals, there's been an average of 25 points scored, whereas the five previous there was 18. So that's a that's a that's a huge difference in a final. You know, seven points is a huge, it's a huge distance. Like, and the points situation is it's just getting a bit out of control because teams are looking at it and, and they're saying to themselves, we don't have to do it. You know, we don't have to go for goals because we can just shoot the lights out. Because when you mix the hurls, the slithers, the condition of the players, you know, and the quality of, of where they can shoot from shooting zones, that all leads itself towards scoring 30, 35. And we could potentially see 40 points in the championship game this year, which is, I don't know if that's ever been done. Um, there, there does need to be a degree of incentivization. Um, I, 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 would, I wouldn't like to see. I know I spoke about it before a heavier ball. I like to see the ball modern. I just kind of modify the small bit. I would like to see. Um, I'd love to see forwards, uh, and I mean this in a good way. The full forward line. I'd love to see them be kept and not being allowed to cross the line. You know what I mean? I'd love to see them. Let's say if you picked an imaginary thirty-yard line and say, right, full forward line, you're not allowed to pass that line inside. I think that would help the situation. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, it, yeah. it would definitely help to say the, the the get around ultra defensive teams if you like. Um, 
But I agree with you guys, incentivization is key. How we go about it, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I know we trialed the sideline cook before with two points. I think guys got around that and they started shooting sidelines from all sides. So that, that had to come back, you know, with, with Joe Kenning and Noel McGrath and whatnot. So if you did go for five points for a goal, I'd say I think there would be a lot more direct hurling. I think it would cut out an awful lot of, you know, middle third passing, as they call it, in, in, in you know, intersection play between between guys who were only 10, 15 yards apart from each other. And again, it was so evident in last night's game, there was guys just shooting passes for 10, 15 yards, sometimes for the sake of it. I think it's just now ingrained into the pattern of play for most teams at the moment because it's it's popular. You know, it's what Limerick are doing and, and it, that's kind of the, that's the magic portion out to a successful team, you know. So uh, five, five points for goal is a good shout. Good shout. I would like it as a goalie though. <laughs> Cork won 140 against Westmeath in, in 2019, I think is, is the record, James. So you can see that being... Yeah. You can see that being surpassed at some point. Yeah, like okay, we, again with respect, the the gulf in class between Cork mm. and and Westmead, let's say, would be would have been substantial at the time. Let's say, so forty points would yes, albeit it would be a surprise, but with that that specific game, not so yeah. much. I think if you're looking at, you know, a Limerick versus a Cork now, I'm not going to say it would happen. Let's say if forty points were hit, my God, that's an element of madness entirely. Yeah, you know, that's when you, when you have quality opposition who are very close, or close ish. That, that kind of score is just, it, it would, uh, yeah, yeah well, eruptions. Let, let's see if it happens against a Division 1 team. And at that point, there, there'll definitely be a, a, a yeah. symposium on what's going wrong. James, this has been brilliant. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. No other folks, thanks. James Scale helping us to preview the start of the Hurling Championship this weekend properly. Dublin against Antrim at 3 o'clock on Saturday, Wexford against Leash at 6 on Saturday. And then we didn't even talk about Clare and Waterford in any detail, but that one throws in at half past 3 on Sunday. You'll get plenty of preview and reaction and analysis to that on Saturday and Sunday on Off the Ball on News Talk. Uh, John Duggan is with us this morning. Who, of course, will be in the presenter's chair on Saturday. John, how are you? What's going on? Uh, good, Jaron Owen. Yeah, it's all about the last 16 of the Euros now. Um, Die Mannschaft going to Wembley next Tuesday uh, for the England-Germany uh, game. 66 and all that, 96 and all that. Gareth Southgate missed penalties. Andy Muller strutting his stuff. All those things. Um, so two all draw against Hungary last night for the Germans. Uh, Leon Goretzka making that uh, heart shape to the Hungarian fans, and then Ronaldo uh, getting to 109 international goals with two penalties against the French. I loved uh, Paul Pogba's silver service delivery at times. It was absolutely fantastic. So what do we got? Well, Saturday five o'clock Wales, Denmark, and Amsterdam. Saturday at eight Italy, Austria at Wembley. Sunday at five the, the Dutch against the Czechs in Budapest. Sunday at 8, Belgium, Portugal. That'll be a brilliant game in Seville. Monday at 5, Croatia, Spain and Copenhagen. Monday at 8, France against Switzerland in Bucharest. Tuesday at 5, England, Germany at Wembley. And Tuesday at 8, Sweden against Ukraine at Hampton. If England get past Germany, they've got a, quite a nice passage to the final. I think everybody else on that side of the group thinks the same, don't they? Or that side <laughs> of the draw. Like everybody's like, ooh. Yeah, um, the Dutch would, Denmark would. Uh, and Denmark have momentum now, uh, even Sweden, Ukraine. Uh, but the other side of the draw, Croatia, Spain against uh, the winners of the France game and Italy potentially against Belgium or Portugal. Brilliant stuff. Portugal didn't really get much of a reward for being the best team. That, that, or, sorry, Belgium didn't get much of a reward for being the best team in the tournament so far, did they? No, they didn't. Uh, and that's sometimes just the way it goes in the international tournaments. Go back to the Dutch and the Germans in 1990. Uh, sometimes the World, the World Cup final or the Euros final is actually earlier in the tournament than the final itself. It definitely feels that way, and that might be the case this year. Uh, although, who knows? Like, I mean, if you're English, you must be feeling pretty good about life, right? Well, it's you know what? It's not about anybody else. It's about how England set up themselves. England will defeat themselves, not the not the Germans, not any other team. This is about Southgate getting it right. Can he get it right? He's got a few days now to make the right calls. They're going to the final, John, aren't they? If they beat Germany, I think they are, yeah. I don't rate the Dutch. Uh, the Denmark, I do think, uh, are... Team are of destiny. Decent. Yeah, team, uh, they're a decent side. Um, but I, I do feel if England can, can, can overcome Germany, they could be in the final. Yeah, there's enough madness about that Dutch team to knock England out. My issue, John, though, is that I, I'm not sure the Dutch will actually get there. I think that there's enough madness about them for, for them to get beaten in the last 16 or in the quarterfinal for them to actually be uh, a semi-finalist for England. Well, remember Poland and Portugal went to penalties last time round, didn't they? And Portugal ended up winning the tournament. There will be shocks in this last 16. Yeah. There will be penalty shootouts. There, uh, look, even Ukraine, who I put as my dark horse, I was a bit disappointed with them in the group stage. You know, <laughs> They were rubbish, be... I thought. 
yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, they weren't uh, well, for about 20 minutes against the Dutch, they were all right. But apart from that, they weren't great. Yeah. But they could beat Sweden. So, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Absolutely right. fascinating. Anything else before we get into virtual insanity? Um, well, just that Cluxton seems to be training again, if you believe the back pages. Um, we'll see. I mean, the, I, I, look, I'm shrugging my shoulders. If he, if he turns up in goal against, uh, was it Wicklow or, or, or Wexford? Um, then, then I'll believe it. Um, I'm already, I'm, I'm, there's nothing, nothing, nothing really that concerns me. Uh, Leona Maguire uh, is interesting because she's involved in the USPGA this week, the third major of the year after such a great performance last week. And also in the Olympics team, like one of our, we're yeah. like, oh, the men's team for the golf, definitely a good medal chance. But you're like, well, hang on a second now, she definitely, definitely, her, her and Stephanie Meadow, they've a, it's a good chance of something coming from the women in the golf as well. So, uh, okay, well, look, speaking of golf, time for this week's Virtual Insanity. How are we getting on? We're, we're doing well. We've had a good few weeks. We, John Ram, um, unfortunately, I should have done a Matt Damon and Rounders and gone all in. Uh, I didn't. Uh, so he was my second pick because I was a bit spooked by that whole Memorial Tournament COVID thing. Uh, unfortunately, I should have gone all in, but we still made a profit of 62% last week uh, because we Cabrera Bayo placed in the first round leader market at 30 to 1. Uh, so it wasn't a bad week. So we're back to pretty much parity. Right, great. Uh, ahead of the Travellers Championship, which starts uh, today. So the eye is pretty much in now, lads. So I do feel um, my eye is in. So what are we going to go with? Okay, Abraham answer. Uh, 28 to 1 for three each way. 23rd in the world, yet to win on the PJ Tour. Uh, one of the shortest hitters on tour. Missed the cut last week, but I think this is a completely different course. 11th in greens hit the, la, this year. Tied for 11th and 8th in this tournament before. He's knocking on the door five top 10s, including the second behind Rory at the Wells Fargo. Abraham he answer from Mexico is the headline tip to break his duck this week at the Travelers Championship at River Highlands, a very short course in Connecticut. Patrick Cantlay, two each way, 16 to 1. Shot a 60 at this course as a 19-year-old amateur. We know he's playing very well. Top of the FedEx Cup standings. Won the Memorial 15th at the US Open last week. Three top 15s in a row in this tournament. You can't leave Patrick Cantlay out. Ricky Fowler, 50 to 1 for two each way. Um, 11th at Memorial, 8th at the US PGA. Failed to qualify for the US Open, so he's fresh. 13th on two appearances at this course. And a very good quality golfer. Still a very talented player. Has had a slump, but I think he's coming back. Ricky Fowler, 50s. Doc Redman, one of my favorites, is 66 for two each way. Second, uh, we had him in the stake for the Palmetto Championship. He was just a shot out of winning it, tied for second. Was 11th in this on his first appearance last year with a 63 at closing round. Plays the easier golf course as well, does Doc. 66 to 1, I think, is value. Will Gordon at 150 to 1 for two each way, shot 27 birdies in this tournament last year to finish in a tie for third, was tied for 14th on his last start. A massive hitter, and people like Bubba Watson have won this tournament before. Will Gordon at 150 for two each way, and Patrick Rogers for Euro 50 each way at 150 to one. Adam in the first round leader market last week, he was very close to getting that. Uh, had three good rounds out of four, has been tied for third of this tournament before, and uh, he could be one of these players. He had a, as impressive a college career as Tiger Woods just has not translated to the main tour. So Patrick Rogers, Will Gordon, Doc Redman, the kind of outsiders, Ricky Fowler, Patrick Hantley, and Abraham Answer. I'm feeling confident. All right, that's this week's Virtual Insanity with John Duggan. It's up now on the OTB Sports app. And of course, yeah, as I said, you can hear more from John all afternoon on Saturday afternoon here on OTB. Uh, and you can get it on the OTB Sports app. Of course, that is going to be Saturday afternoon, the first game in the Lions series. They play Japan. Don't know if it's going to be a test yet. Probably will be. I think at the end of the year they're going to decide it is. And then uh, the eight matches that they're going to play in South Africa. Every single second of every game live on Off The Ball. You can get it on Off The Ball on News Talk. Brian O'Driscoll and Alan Quinn are going to be alongside Neil Tracy on commentary for the three test matches. Devin Toner, Neve Briggs and Jack Carty among the co-coms for the warm-up games. Andy Dunn in the commentary box alongside Neil for the three o'clock kickoff live this Saturday afternoon on News Talk, our coverage will be brought to you in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. So let's crack with that. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty exciting little while. Uh, this Saturday is quite the day of sport. It is uh, one of those mega sporting Saturdays, obviously those uh, last 16 games. The last 16 fair on Saturday, probably the weakest, but still uh, you've got what is a semi-test, let's call it, in, in the Lions. And obviously uh, you've got Mayo and Kerry in action, you've got hurling. Uh, it's from three o'clock to ten o'clock, basically wall to wall on a on a variety of different levels, which kind of makes these summer Saturdays, I think. 
Exactly. It's 8.54 this morning. If you want to get in touch, you can uh, WhatsApp us. 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Leave a comment in the YouTube stream. We'll get to that. I use the hashtag OTBAM. Uh, Sue Murphy, good morning to you. How are you? Morning. How are you? Well, we're all talking about uh, murder in West Cork, right? It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's Sophie Tuscan season on everything. Yeah, like everywhere. This is out on Sunday on Netflix. Um, I've seen both of them now. Um, I actually had the, the Jim Sheridan one for last week, but it was really heavily embargoed, so I couldn't really talk about it. But there is all of the, the drama around that that the family have asked for the interviews to be taken out. They thought um, the documentary was quite sympathetic to Ian Bailey. Um, I think everyone knows the story of Sophie Toscan de Pontier, but I don't know if they know all of the details. You know, she was murdered in West Cork in 96. Her body was found at the bottom of the laneway outside of her house, and there's never anyone been um, convicted of her, her murder. It's, they, I have to say, I think the Jim Sheridan doc is the better doc. Um, he actually features in it, and it's not, that's not, I was really surprised when he popped up on screen because it's not like him to do something like that. I was like, oh, and he's kind of telling the story. And I think it's that's actually quite good because he's very attached to that story. Um, and he's been embedded in it for about 20 years. And he's like, he basically is so attached with that he wants the justice for Sophie. And I think he actually did a good job. Like, that's what's really upsetting about them taking out the family interviews because I thought he got their grief across very well and why they want uh, justice for her and what had happened. And it's just, it's the whole thing is such a tragic case. But the Netflix one, in comparison, there's three episodes in that. There's five in the Jim Sheridan one. It's a much zippier, like, it's very, very fast. It moves through things very, very quickly. Um, like, the first episode, I'd say, is probably, the, like, one to three of, of Sheridan's. Sheridan really lays the groundwork of, you know, the area, what her life was like, what her family was like. They kind of get through that a little bit quicker in the Netflix one. It seems a bit more dramatic than Sheridan's is. I think he's a little bit more sensitive, actually, than the Netflix one is. Um, I, I did feel after I'd seen almost five episodes of both, I was a bit like, this is like, I felt uncomfortable. Uh, I felt uncomfortable knowing the amount of information that I knew about that woman. And I am one of those people who loves true crime, but I, I think it was probably because I was watching it back, like back to back. Um, I, I just think in terms of like, if you were looking at them as documentaries, you'd say Sheridan's doc documentary is better. But um, the true still, crime thing is really interesting, right? Like it's grand when it's over in America and it has nothing to do yeah. with us. And it's like harlar when it's yeah. down the road, a few fields over, essentially. And these people are living and walking amongst us. And there's there's um, really compelling content that sucks you in. And yet it's clearly in a way sucking us in that's for our enjoyment and entertainment. Because that's what yeah. it is. That's what, like, we sit down, we sit down on our couch to be shocked, to be horrified, but ultimately it's entertainment and it's to do numbers and it's for clicks and it's for eyeballs and it's yet the murder of a woman. It's yeah. all, it's, it, and look, I mean, I, I think the thing about the podcast was that it was, it was slow and again, I, I don't know, like, I don't know how I can have this duplicity in my own mind where I think the podcast is okay, but I'm very, like, uh, squeamish about sitting down and watching these, and yet I, I probably will, like. Yeah, and, and that's what's uncomfortable about it, is it, like the down the road thing, like it's West Cork. Like the intros into the, both of these are news reports of voices that you know from the radio, or Marion Finucane talking about it on Crime Line. And that just gives an extra edge to it, I think, when you're watching as an Irish audience, because this is a really remote part of Cork with a, a kind of an international kind of, of, of population. There's a lot of people down there from different parts of the world that are artists, producers, filmmakers, all that kind of stuff. And then a small local population. So there's something really eerie about it. And like, uh, like for her to be in that house by herself at Christmas, nobody heard anything, nobody knew what happened. It's just... I, I, I was actually quite upset by it. I, like, and one of the, any of those documentaries, you know, like I watched Case File and listened to Case File back to back, I've listened to 140 episodes. I've never felt that I think I know too much here. And, and I really felt that with this. What do you think, Owen? You're, you are from down the road. I do think that the grim outcome of this is that people uh, are going to 
people are, are going this, this will create a sort of cult around west cork a little bit almost not not just as a tourist destination but as a, a place of intrigue internationally which is um which is kind of grim to think about that it kind of plays into what you're saying there that there is a sort of fascination that triggers the same part of our brain that is kind of used for positive things and for us to have this thing happening down the road where there will be an international fascination with is something that kind of sits a little bit uneasily. With but we don't people. care. We don't care when it's in Mexico or yeah, Canada it's a or, contradiction. or England. Complete like. contradiction. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, that's that's just the way it is. Well, like, um, like, sorry to slightly change the subject here. But what, what is what is with documentaries of a similar subject always coming out at once? Sue, is is there like some sort of uh, is there some sort of embargo on certain content? Because obviously we had the fire situation a couple of years ago where you had an Amazon and, yeah. and Netflix. What, what, like, why does, the, why does this happen? Like, what's the content decision there? The, like, I have my suspicions about what happened. I'm afraid to say nothing in case I could do, but I think there might have been something in the works there at Netflix before, and then Sheridan was working on this separately, and they just, I, I think they both knew what when they were coming out, and they were like, okay, we need to, we need to get these out of the round at the same time. <laughs> Well, it happens in the film industry all the time where uh, one studio announces that they're doing one type of blockbuster and the other studios will knock together yeah, any, any old shite spoiler to make sure that they, if it's a massive success, you cash in on it and you also get the opportunity to like steal its thunder a little bit if, exactly. if yours gets out yeah. first. So. But it's, it's, like, I mean, that it's kind of like, like, not to compare, but like find... No. Find a Nemo on Shark Tale. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, yeah. Actually, I, I hadn't really computed that, but like, I guess that kind of uh, that kind of also plays into the grim nature of it as well. Just the uh, how, as you're right too. Like, I mean, this is just a, a purely, or Jerry, the, the purely commercial thing to get clicks, to get views, to get eyeballs on it. And think, of it think of it like this, though. In in, uh, in 2002, uh, News Talk put out a daily sports show called Off the Ball, and then within about two and a half, or three, or four years. RTE suddenly decided that there was going to be a nightly sports radio show. Yeah. This is what happens in the game. It is what happens. It's uh, the, the game going to stay again. It, it's like I mean, but this is this doesn't seem to be like a response. It seems like uh, simultaneous. Uh, like, and I, I'm sure that there is insider information, so they know that something's coming months and months and months in advance, and uh, they can get ahead of it. Well, it's it, yeah, camera crews down in a certain area. Somebody rings somebody, and it's like, oh, was that your guys? No, what? No, that wasn't us. That was who was it? What? And then there's a rush from the executives to... Because the thing is, the audience for one is probably the same audience for the other, right? Like yeah. I, a lot of people are actually going to watch both. They will, they, yeah. And the people, I think, will come to... What, what's going to happen here is that the, the Netflix thing is going to be the, the biggest one of, of all of the works on this, on, on this subject. And then people will go to the Sky one and people will go to the podcast and people will just gorge on information. Whenever we watch something, like whenever you watch a movie, the first thing you do is, well, the first thing I do is maybe go on to IMDb, look at the cast members I'm not familiar with, look at the backstory that's based on a true story. People, once they get a taste of something, even if it's uh, a multi-part series, just want more of that thing. So you're right, they will absolutely be, be gorging on this a little bit. But maybe it's the sort of thing, Sue, that you get your fill after a while, especially if you binge just one of them. Yeah, like, the other thing that I have a problem with with this is uh, the family are so desperate. They're desperate to find out information, you know, I, that's what's really upsetting about it is it like you can tell they're just going to do anything to try and get information about what happened to her and if this is the next avenue then they have to take it and that's I actually find that really hard to watch her father he can't get through the sentence to talk about her without breaking down crying so it's it's quite difficult I, I found it quite diff the whole thing quite difficult to watch actually. Uh, and the other thing is the cops, the role of the cops and all this. I hope that is, uh, I haven't seen this yet, but I hope that that like, is half, oh, God. half of the entire thing. Yeah, it, uh, it's a good bit and they really focus in on it like they, it, there was not a good job done around this, you know. No, a fairly horrific blundering uh, at various different stages. And that's why uh, no one's ever going to feel comfortable about whatever comes out of this. Uh, right, so let's move on. The uh, films this week. Yeah, so Fast and Furious 9 is out um, this week, just to mention it. I actually haven't seen it yet, but I plan on going to see it. But I, I absolutely love Fast and Furious because <laughs> they're the films that you go into cinema, you have popcorn, you have a drink, and you just turn your brain off for two hours. And I think everyone who's involved in it knows how crap they are, and everyone who's going to see it knows how crap they are, and everyone's fine about that. And I, I like that about it. It doesn't take itself too seriously. But um, I love the, the whole plotline around this one. is like Vin Diesel has an ev evil twin brother who just shows up. You're like, oh, my God. 
gosh. Are we going to act back to Dallas for plot lines? It's just at, like, it's hilarious. But anyway, on the other side, um, we went to see The Father last week and went to an actual cinema, which was a lovely experience. Um, we were walking, we were walking in the door and I said, oh, this is going to be really sad. And he went, I don't know anything about it. And I was like, well, it's a film about dementia. It's going to be really sad. And he was like, oh, we're not going to a quiet place. And I was like, no, that's a very different film. So The Father is about uh, Anthony Hopkins, who's suffering late in life with uh, dementia. And he, like, it's told from his point of view. So it's brilliant because it's it's him trying to piece together a day or a couple of hours or what's happening. And there's all these, days, like it moves to different types of the times of the day, different things that he's drinking, think of it, different things that he's wearing, different people he's talking to, doesn't understand who his daughter is. It's actually like, you know, with Anthony Hopkins winning the Oscar, everyone was like, should Chadwick Boseman have won that? No, it, like he is absolutely amazing. This is the best role he's ever played. Is it something you, like there's two very different films there if you want to go see them in the cinema, like Fast and Fur Furious is probably your all entertainment action film. But The Father, if you're looking for something that's a, a very good, it's it's borderline a play in a, in a film. Anthony Hopkins is spectacular in this. And you'll come out and be like, I, I really don't want to get old. It's it's very, it's very depressing. Really hits it on the hits it on the head. Don't worry, the uh, entire planet is on fire and we're not gonna get old. We're gonna be one of those generations that doesn't make it to the we're gonna we're gonna see the ends of the earth, so don't worry. That's the, the <laughs> cheery thing you should take away. So make sure you spend the weekend binge watching something. Something uh, apocalyptic or that. Uh, if you miss it this week is the staircase. Yeah, I, I just thought it with the, the true crime stuff, <laughs> keeping it in that kind of vein, the staircase was one that I've never in my life watched so much information about blood spatter. Um, but that's that's what this is all about. So it's a, it, a man called Michael Peterson, whose wife was found at the bottom of the stairs dead and he was uh, suspected of the, her murder. But he said that she fell down the stairs and he had nothing to do with it. And all of the episodes of this go through, it's, it's sort of like the jinx, you're never quite sure where you stand with it or what his involvement is. And he's a, a strange individual at the best of times. So you're really, you're second guessing every time you feel, and he's a very like strong family unit who are very supportive of him. So, and you're kind of like, did he, did he do it? All the way through it. And to be honest, what's interesting about this, I mean, obviously it's, it's terrible. There's a, a woman dead, same thing we're talking about with Sophie, but the, it's him, he is, he loves having the camera around. He loves talking about poetry. He and then there's this other thing where he's like, "I have nothing to do with the like with the, the death of my wife." It's it's actually fascinating. Like, and it's a real binge watch. If you sit down, you're not going to be able to turn it off. You'll go through every single episode. Yeah. So we did that and watched it uh, probably around the time. So 2018, I think. I can't remember what happens. I actually, I'm <laughs> I'm on the Wikipedia page. You're going, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's funny how the 13 episodes that we were com completely consumed by is just 13, like, like, it's just so no, long. No room in my brain for uh, what happened. I, I couldn't tell you if he's out now or uh, if he's in now. So um, anyway, don't spoil yeah. it for us. Uh, no. Grant, you haven't seen it, have you? No, thank you for forgetting everything there. I look forward to watching all 13 episodes. <laughs> uh, you, very quickly, you want to mention Mary of Easttown, you're finished it. Yes, um, I uh, like. Uh, Tom, I don't know if Tommy put up my texts. I guess the end, and I ruined it for Tommy <laughs> in the process. But um, I was absolutely delighted because I, I had spent ages thinking about it. Like I was borderline with an incident room in the house with all of the lines going to all the different people who were involved. But um, it got to, it got to the end, and I was down on my knees in front of the telly with my arms up, going, "Yes, I guess the right person." So that's the way I watch TV. It's not about shame; it's about being right. But um, no, it's if you haven't seen it, it's it's really like Kate Winslet and it is really really excellent. And like there was a part of me that at the start of the last episode, I was like, I'll be fine if they just do this about what happens with her and her family. She's really really interesting, and her family were amazing. But um, I really enjoyed it. Okay. But I'm just delighted I got it right. And Halston? I loved Halston. Like, if you're into these, like, it's it's a Ryan Murphy thing. So if you think Glee, just, like, turn your brain off, everything looks pretty, that's 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 what it is. And it's really great because of that. And the, the last thing I have to mention, because Owen is such a big fan, is Love Island is back on Monday at 9 o'clock. Nice. Um, <laughs> 
you want to talk about your your problems with I'm Ireland? Just um, checking <laughs> what are the Euros fixtures on Monday night. Does anybody, does anybody <laughs> have them handy? Is it that's uh, that's uh, the night before England, isn't it? Uh, whatever it is, uh, France, they, Switzerland. France, Switzerland. Right. You can flick that over two nil at halftime. No, I'm not talking about switching up, but I think for the sake of humankind, France, Switzerland should be postponed. Uh, should be moved back to the two o'clock game the next day, or pushed forward to the two o'clock game that day. UEFA. Uh, who've had a shocker of a tournament can finally do something right by moving a game out of the way of Love Island because uh, this is important and uh, it's it, it finally we get our culture back because we had a summer without Love Island last year and I think that's the main reason why the pandemic was so tough on everyone. I mean we were joking about this but like in the off the ball office every single person watches this talks about it like no. Joe Malloy went on not, and talked to Ivan Yates about it. Not but you're the person. you're the only one. Well, there you go. There you go. It's good to be. It's good to be home wearing the pink T-shirt sometimes. That's a cultural <laughs> even, reference. We even got a Adrian called Simpsons. Was it, was Andy it, Lee was in our Love Island group. Like that's the extent to what we're talking about here. You know. Uh, right. I I uh, have finished Friday Night Lights, and um, we should definitely talk about that because uh, it's. Oh yeah, it's one of my favorites. It's really really excellent. I was surprised at how good it was and how um, it stood up and all that kind of stuff too. So, anyway, Sue, good stuff. Thanks, a million. Thanks, a million. What's out in the podcast this week? Oh, we have um, it's Andrea Gilligan, and she's going to be talking about Shawshank Redemption. So she, it's a film she used to watch with her dad. Her dad sadly passed away, but it was one of those ones that they used to go back to together all the time. So it's a really nice story. So we, we have that out and let's go back to this week. Okay, so the podcast is called Let's Get Back To. It's available on the Go Loud player and uh, we also stick it up on the... OTB highlights, yeah. There you go. OTB AM, brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razor. Sue is with us every Thursday to tell you what to watch for the weekend. Here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio for the rest of the day. At 11 o'clock live, it's the Euro 2020 show. OTB Gold at 1 is Cora Staunton. Our History Sport Extra Series with Paul Rouse at 3. Our retro panel football special with Hartson, Holland and Cunningham. Uh, Brian, I'm just going to meet Ethan Asewa as OTB Gold tonight at 6. We're going to be back after these. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports is the place to follow all the live and uninterrupted Lions coverage this summer. Lions legends Brian O'Driscoll and Alan Quinlan will be our commentators for the three huge tests against South Africa. We'll have plenty of expert analysis and input too from the likes of Devin Toner, Niamh Briggs, Sean Cronin and Jack Carty. That's the Lions tour against the world champion South Africa. All the big match build up, match commentary and analysis live on the OTB Sports app. Why not check out the Boyle Sports Betting app for the latest betting and stats on every player and team with the Boyle Sports Euro Stat Center. Rated four and a half stars on the App Store, you'll find all our latest odds and offers for the Euros. So remind us where to go, Stevie G. Boyle Sports, this is betting. 18 plus bet responsibly, gamblingcare.ie. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie OTB with Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 12 minutes past nine this morning, we're going back to Gaelic football and uh, the championship build-up is really underway at this point and we're particularly uh, looking forward to eventually seeing Kerry against Dublin. Uh, so no better man to talk to than Eamon Fitzmaurice. Airgrid have announced a five-year partnership extension for the GA official timing sponsorship. Airgrid, the state-owned company that manages and develops Ireland's electricity grid to deliver a cleaner energy future, is now in its sixth year as the official timing partner of the GA. As part of the announcement, three-time All-Ireland winning player and US, uh, sorry, All-Ireland winning manager with Kerry, Eamon Fitzmaurice spoke to us yesterday. Um, the intercounty thing is a huge commitment and it's a huge uh, commitment for everyone in your life. It's a commitment for, for, for you, obviously, but it's also a commitment for your wife, your family, you know, your, your extended family, kind of everyone's nearly involved in it really because there's so much goes into it. So there's, there's a lot to be considered when you're getting involved in it, but um, at the moment I'm happy where I am. I'm happy looking on and uh, enjoying supporting supporting the Kerry lads. 
And how are you broadening your horizons then on a coaching level, as you mentioned there? Is it just from a bit of training here and there and, and watching as many games as possible or, or are you tapping into other resources as well? Watching and I'm starting to read a bit again, which I hadn't been doing and uh, the appetite is there to possibly start attending coaching conferences and things like that again, which wasn't. It just genuinely wasn't there for a while. Um, I suppose I had spent uh, so long at it that uh, I needed a bit of a, a break from it and even just to refresh my mind and re refresh uh, my thinking on the game and everything, I felt that it was good to take a bit of a step back and uh, allow allow that hunger to return naturally and uh, and it has and, I, and I'm enjoying doing that and I'm enjoying doing the bit of reading and stuff at the moment and uh, uh, you know, just getting, getting the brain ticking over in, in that way again. Anything good that you'd recommend on the reading front? Um, anything good? <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, there's plenty of stuff. Um, a, a book I had read at the time and I'm rereading at the moment is uh, uh, Pochettino's book he did with um, Guy and Balaga uh, when he was in Spurs. I remember at the time I read it and it was a kind of a speed read, but there was there was some good insights in it, so I'm rereading that. I read um, Kevin Welch's book recently. Uh, very good insight, a lot of good stuff in that, and uh, very honest and open book in fairness to, to, to Kevin. And I enjoyed that read. So um, they're kind of the two that I, I have on the go at the moment, but I'm sure I'll dip into other stuff when I'm off over the summer. The, the Pochettino thing is fascinating, isn't it? The way, I guess, he took a, a club from a, a fairly decent level and all of a sudden got them to a whole other level when it came to their commitments, to the, to the meters they were running on the training pitch. A lot of fellas were ruthlessly cut from that team. Like, that is straight off, I, I'd imagine, a, a Bible for any coach out there in terms of how you can make measured improvements as a coach. Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. And I just think done in a very uh, exact but caring way as well. Mm. And that, that certainly comes across in the book. And uh, once, once, you were, once you were with him, uh, he'd do anything for you, but he wasn't afraid to take the hard decisions either. And uh, just all the different experiences he had himself, both as a player and as a, a manager, feeding into his coaching style. And um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good read, and I'm enjoying it. And you know, like I said, I remember reading it at the time. I think it probably came out maybe September, October, 2017, around that time. I remember. Yeah, the season like was in flow, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I remember reading it back around that time. And, uh, you know, like I said, at the time, it was a, I kind of shot through it, but I'm reading it uh, a, a bit more measured this time and probably taking in more of it. You're not a Spurs fan, are you? I'm not. No, I'm a, I'm a Man United fan. Right. Well, what, can, what can a GEA coach learn from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer then, do you think? <laughs> well, I think in fairness to him and... We're in a group of United fans and we'd be debating back and forth. But I think one thing is he's certainly very good at tapping into the tradition of what Man United should be about. And I think he's trying to bring back um, basically the Alex Ferguson values and uh, things that might have been lost in the, in, the, in the meantime since Alex Ferguson finished up and might have been a bit diluted with all the chopping and changing that has happened uh, on the managerial front, but I think he's bringing stability, um, and I think he's, in terms of his values and the way he looks at what Man United should be and should represent. I like that side of it from the coaching perspective. Um, I'm still still looking to see what exactly <laughs> is going on, but. Uh, uh, we'll give him more time and we'll see where that goes. That's it. And the thing about Solskjaer is that at any of those great moments during the season they just had, the crowd, if they were there, would have been unbelievable. Like Because everybody, every Manchester United fan, I'd imagine, just really wants him to do well. So hopefully, yeah. from, a, from a United perspective, that comes into play uh, next season. Uh, Eamon, when it comes to the Gaelic football, then, uh, like this season has already been talked up as the, the, the saviour of modern Gaelic football. Is the hype real? Like, can we believe what we saw in the league with these big score lines and lots of kick passing and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, so far it is. Um, look, I think a big thing has been playing a league, uh, you know, later with with the pitch conditions, the the air conditions, decent weather for a lot of the games. Um, in terms of will it continue for the championship? I think. Look, even for a lot of the games, teams 
some teams were still setting up quite defensively. They were getting bodies behind the ball, but players were just playing excellent football. They were taking the right options. They were kicking huge scores. They were kicking scores from out the field. Um, they were getting through defences, even if there was plenty of bodies back there with pace, with good movement, with one twos, with good, just good football. So I, I think there's, um, you know, while there is still strong defensive structures in place by some teams, I think teams are getting better and better at picking holes in it. I think players are becoming more and more accurate, and uh, they're probably getting the ball to the to the shooters and to the best shooters more often. Um, so yeah, it augurs it augurs well, and it's been the league has been outstanding, and there's been brilliant football across all of the divisions. So hopefully it'll continue now for the summer. One of the things that seems to be popping up is that teams are now realizing that the full court press is almost a necessity in, in a lot of games. Are you seeing this as a more aggressive press even from, uh, say, 2016 in, the, in that semi-final where you guys really would have done it to Dublin that year? Yeah, no, I think it's it's constantly evolving. And uh, obviously when we tried that that day, that was extreme and it was new and it, it worked. But we unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity to do it more in the second mm-hmm. half. Um, but teams have tweaked this and, you know, for us starting off that day, it was a kind of a static enough zone in terms of that the players were getting to a zone and they were kind of staying within their zone. But more and more teams now are getting ready, are getting better at it being a moving zone and adjusting as the keeper is kicking and making it even harder for the goalkeeper. So there's constant tweaks going on with it. But, um, you know, all teams have figured out really that it is risk reward, but the risk, you know, or the reward far outweighs the risk from the point of view that even if you lose the kick out, you still have time to get bodies back. Um, once it isn't a boomer over the top and you can get cut, cut open. And some teams are trying that. And in fairness to goalkeepers like Rory Began, um, Niall Morgan, you know, from Sean Patton, fellas that have a big boost and that can kick us. 70 and 80 yards they're trying that and you'd probably see a couple of goals from that over the summer but um, I think overall teams are being rewarded for pressing like that and um, we'll, we'll probably see more and more of it for the summer The moving zone is, is very interesting like I, I know we, we might be at risk of like getting into too much of the nitty gritty here but does that change the type of player you would be looking for as a coach in, in your forward line then is it, does it just favour more athletes again? It, it doesn't, it doesn't. I think, look, all players are so athletic now and they're so, you, you see very few, you know, players that aren't able to move. So if 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 at all, they're all so athletic and they're so, um, you know, mobile and and agile as well. So I, I yeah, no, I think this uh, teams, you know, particularly when they get the press on and when, like I said, when they're moving around and when they're being, that bit of flexibility is coming into us. Uh, it's exciting to watch and I think, look, again, when we get the crowds back to games, it's certainly a thing that will get people off their seats and uh, I think everyone likes it unless you're the poor goalkeeper and you're after losing two or three in a row and you're trying to figure a way out of this. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's something I mentioned in in, um, in an examiner column I wrote earlier on the year. I'm looking for the next step in it now rather than the off, the team that are pressing what's the next step in terms of beating the press and I'd love to see something like an overload going the opposite direction if you know what I mean if if the team taking the kick out are taking the risk that they're loading it up the other way and that they're leaving players inside you know that if you've three or four in the full forward line and you're just letting them there because you know yeah. it's going long and you know it's going to a certain part of the field and if you lose it then you're trying to adjust uh, I think there's something in that but I'm I'm looking forward to seeing, like I said, who's going to be the one to to bring the next step in terms of breaking a press. I think there's only so much more you can do in terms of setting the press and the kick out, but breaking it going the other way will be is the interesting thing for me at the moment. Right. We'll keep we'll keep an eye on that over the next little while. Like I guess Kerry to a point have got caught on that on a number of occasions. It happened once against Ross Common, the most obvious example, obviously, Con O'Callaghan uh, against Dublin. Is that then where you would pick as a weak point in Kerry's title charge this year? Yeah, again, look, that's the that's the risk reward yeah. thing. And if you're look, I think against Dublin, they're so good if you give them all their own kickouts, and if you don't, 
at least push push up and contest some of them and possibly that's the way it approaches is it is it is it is a mix but um i think unless you're giving them and unless you're giving them some problems in their own kick out you're not going to win the match it's as simple as that they're too good and if you're giving them uh 50% of the ball straight off off their own kick out they they're going to beat you and they're going to beat you pulling up so i think you have to go after it but that's the beauty of the league and that's the beauty of uh, mistakes like that happening, um, you know, there'll be tweaks and Peter Keane and the management team will be looking at that. If this happens again, this is the way we're going to deal with it. And that's the beauty of having matches and having the context of matches to improve and stuff. And that's one of the most enjoyable things of being involved with a team or managing or coaching a team is seeing those things, trying to fix it. If it happens again, that you have fixed it. Um, and uh, it's just making you stronger all the time. It does seem, when it comes to Kerry, um, and that there is now a, a cohort of players like Dermot O'Connor and Dara Moynihan who aren't just fit to make the 15. They're fit to make a real mark in big games this year. Is that the way you see it? And, and how important will that be later in the summer? Yeah, big time. And look, I think the, you know, the players from the successful minor teams now are, are starting to really put their stamp on the team. And... Um, you know, going up to the lads from the 2014 team, which would be the likes of Brian O'Bealglia, Tom Sullivan, those lads, back to the younger lads then. They now are there a couple of years, you know, Tom and Brian and them are there since 2016. So they've, they have a lot of experience in terms of being involved in the squad and then getting into the team. Uh, the likes of Dara Minahan and uh, uh, Dermot O'Connor. Dermot started the All-Ireland replay in 2019, mm. which was a huge experience for him. And he's continued to develop. And he, look, he's going to be a fantastic player for Kerry. And he had a, he had a brilliant uh, league this year. And hopefully he'll continue on into the championship. Similarly with Dara Minahan, you know, he's a, um, a real type of player you'd want on your team in terms of he'd do the hard work. He can be abrasive. He'll win breaks. But he's also excellent on the ball and he'll get scores for you. So it's great to see those fellas now um, with experience under their belt, probably more comfortable now as well, uh, starting and knowing that they can contribute. And uh, like I said, hopefully that will continue on into the championship and that uh, if and when Kerry get to Crow Park, that they'll be, they'll be really ready for that, those battles at that stage. And they've got as tough a Munster Championship as you could possibly ask for. It should be Clare, Tip, then Cork. Like people will say this is Yerrorism or whatever, but I mean, that is as tough as you could possibly ask for throughout the, the Munster Championship. And you would assume, and it is an assumption, that the ghosts of last year will ensure that there won't be any complacency in, the, in those three games. Yeah, and look, I think in fairness to, to the lads last year, I don't think complacency would have been a factor. I think it was a poor performance on the day, and that can happen. Mm. Um, I think the days of complacency are gone going back to my own time when we were involved whether it was Clare or Tipperary or Limerick or Watford or whoever we were playing in the Munster Championship it was the same we prepared the same as if we were playing uh, Dublin it was, it, you know it was, it was as simple as that and of course you can't get into a player's mind and a player might expect to win a game or whatever but if they're not performing uh, they're going to be hauled off and we certainly you know would have prepared for every team the same way and I think, look, in Kerry, the, the lads, the management and the players are going to be thinking game by game, but their goal is to win the All-Ireland. It's as simple as that. It has to be, and it is. So if you want to win the All-Ireland in 2021, you couldn't have a better path uh, to, to, to Sam Maguire in terms of you're going to get three games in Munster, first of all, instead of two, which is fantastic. Clare are playing very well. They're always a sticky wicket. I do think Fitzgerald Stadium mm. is a factor. Generally, Kerry, I think the last time we played them there, my last year in 2018, I, I think we scored more than 30 points that day. I think we kicked a huge point total that day. Um, but when we played them in Cusick Park, it's always tough. But after mm. the league they've had and they've improved again this year, they're going to be a tough game. If you win that, you're away in Semple Stadium to the Munster champions who've had a bad league campaign and who are going to be very, very anxious to make a big statement that it wasn't a flash in the plan. So that'll be a big test. Kerry come through that. You've Cork and Killarney who beat them last year. So there are three great games 
you go to Crow Park, you're playing the Ulster champions, regardless of who comes out of there, and it's hard to call it, they're going to be well battle-hardened, battle and that's going to be another test for Kerry. And if then you beat them and you earn the right to be in an All-Ireland final against Dublin from the other side, well, you're well tested and you're well ready. So I think from Kerry's perspective, um, the plan will be to win the All-Ireland. To win the All-Ireland, it's a brilliant route. But of course, that starts Saturday evening in Killarney and you have to perform in Killarney against Clare um, to make sure you get on to the next step. Absolutely. And while everybody will be well aware of that, my last question will probably undo all of that. Is there a chink in the Dublin armour from what you've seen so far this year? Um, I don't see them. Uh, I think every year since 2016, we've been hoping that there'd be a lessening of the hunger, um, that there would be signs of decay, but uh, I haven't seen it. Um, I think they went through the, the 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 league in third gear. They blooded a lot of new players without their manager being at the games with them. Um, they did what they had to do during the league. Um, can they be beaten? Of course they can. Of course they can. They, uh, you know, they're 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 a brilliant team, but they can be beaten. To beat them, though, you have to get everything right in the day. To beat most teams, you have to get most right. And it'll do you, and you'll get away with a few mistakes. Against Dublin, you have to get almost everything right. And that's possible. A perfect performance is possible. But um, they still have, you know, as well as all the extra players that they've brought through, they still have brilliant man markers and the likes of Fitzsimons, Johnny Cooper. They still have James McCarthy. They still have Fenton. They still have Scully and Kilkenny going very well. They still have Conor Callaghan. So all of those players are playing really well. Um, and as long as, they've, uh, as they have those players, they'll be very hard to stop. They can be stopped, but you have to get everything right. Yeah, that's for sure. It's going to be a brilliant summer ahead. Just a reminder that Airgrid have announced a five-year partnership extension for the GAA official timing sponsorship. Airgrid are the state-owned company that manages and develops Ireland's electricity grid to deliver a cleaner energy future. And they're now in their sixth year as the official timing partner of the GEA. And as part of all of that, Eamon Fitzmaurice was speaking to us here on OTBAM. Eamon, great to chat to you as ever. Enjoy the football this weekend. Thanks, Owen. I presume with your father and everything else, GEA was a big part of your life growing up. And you were just saying before the break there that it was number one for a good while. Yeah, it was. I Hurling was always number one, eh? And then we didn't have any... We didn't have any like rugby in our school, and so I played with the local club here in Burr from under eight all the way up then until kind of under 18. And then it was like around then when I got in with the Leinster under 18 clubs, and it was at a point then where I kind of had to like, or you know, like make a call mm-hmm. whether to whether like to give like the rugby a go or to play like the two. And yeah, ultimately, like I decided to hold off from the hurling and give the rugby go and I suppose it's been a long journey to where I am now but um, hurling like you know like was always and probably like will be always like my first love so and was it just the lure of professional sports life that sucked you into rugby you know I gotta have a crack at this because what a great way to make a living was that yeah I guess it was it was just yeah I guess it was like when I was playing rugby like I was always you know, pretty good, like, and I always maybe thought that, like, I could make maybe a career out of it. So, yeah, it was the, it was the whole, I suppose, idea of being able to do what you love, like, and getting paid for it. Mm. Um, With the hurling, like, obviously, that's not really, like, a viable option. So, I suppose it was, um, Joe, yeah, it was the idea of, I suppose, like, the professional, um, you know, like, life. Yeah. 100%, yeah. So the Leinster contract never came and then Ulster swooped in and gave you a three-year deal, which was obviously great for you. So you were kind of, point to prove, did you feel you were a bit unlucky not to get a, a deal with Leinster? Obviously very competitive there. What was your mindset going up to Ulster? Um, yeah, like I did two years in the Leinster Sub Academy, um, which I enjoyed. Like it was great. Like I met a lot of um, great friends in there. But like Leinster is obviously, as everyone like knows, it's very um, competitive. Eh? So mm. after the Irish Twenties, I kind of had an idea that I wasn't going to be brought in with Leinster anymore. Um, so 
Kieran Campbell, who had he he was my head coach with the Irish 19s, and he would have been in with the 20s as well. He gave me a call, kind of after the 20s, and was like, "Here, look, like uh, like we've got a three year um, spot for you up here in the uh, academy if you like them up." So, you know, like I rang my dad and I rang my mum and I rang everybody, and like I asked, but like you know, like I knew I was always going to go up mm. and. Yeah, I decided like to go up, and then yeah, like that was like the next um, like like st- like st- um, stage, I guess, on my journey. Like, so yeah. I was up there for three years, and like I loved Belfast, like you know. But um, when I was up there, halfway through it, halfway through it, I got a bad back injury, which put me out for probably a year and a half. Which, when I look back on it now, it probably halted like a lot of my progress and like my development so mm. it was a nasty injury like but like I you know like I love my time up there right in Belfast I heard so it was a back injury I think and it came like in the most almost you know unexpected way Out of nowhere, kind of. yeah you, you were doing some squatting and it was weights and what was it bulging disc and a bit of sciatic it was a bulging well. disc it was a bulging disc in my lower spine which mm. it was a strange one actually Joe because I didn't have any pain whatsoever in my back it was actually all in my right leg right. so it was going down all the way to my calf and it was like it was right in the nerve and I don't know if you've ever had it like but like nerve um pain anywhere in the body is probably like the worst you can have so <laughs> had that for about a year God. or a bit and, and it was it, probably yeah I don't like looking back at it, it was right. horrible now to be honest but we got over it and you know, like all like the doctors and everything up in Ulster and like everyone up there was great really like and they got me over it and like I got the operation there at the end of 2019 mm. and I've had no issues with it um, Touch wood. you know like ever since so I'm very grateful to everyone up there like you know and was that like almost a constant kind of pain down your leg or just it was yeah oh. so yeah like everything like sneezing coughing laughing as well you know like trying to go to the uh, like the bathroom as well was was always a chore and then sleeping was probably the worst like you know like you'd be like lying on your leg and then it'd go really sore and then like you'd roll over and it would be exactly the same on the other side so Oof. just constant pain eh? it was just horrible like you know for a year over it now sorry for a year for just over a year joy yeah it was a long time like now when i look mm. back at it like to go through that and then like a bit the bullet at the end and i got the operation which Looking back at it now, I probably should have gotten it a lot earlier, to be honest, but mm. it is what it is, like, you know. And how did you cope during that year then, Jack? Well, you must have been fairly miserable with the whole thing, I would have thought. I was pretty miserable. It's hard as well when you've got friends. So at the time, I was living with Jake Stockdale, obviously, who was flying it with Ireland at the time, and, like, him and, like, you know, like, Adam McBurney and lads like that who were going really well. So when you're struggling at home and then like obviously like the lads are all um playing like and doing really well it's obviously hard like but um yeah because they just get this through i suppose yeah this was so you went up to ulster in 2017 so i mean in 2018 jacob stockdale is the toast of the rugby world and ireland are winning the grand slam yeah, That's that. he was flying it yeah yeah okay and you're you're in bits even going to the bathroom i'm on the floor on a stall now i was adam mcburney will actually laugh this he always used to slag me about like I would spend hours on the floor in the living room like like stretching and like rolling around and he used to take the hand out me like but um yeah like all the boys were flying it like you know but I was there just like an old you know like an old man at that stage like it yeah. was really bad you know yeah I can imagine and you're thinking my career is going down the toilet here this is just not going to work out at all at all so the operation did the trick did it pretty quickly you're back on your feet and you were moving okay after the operation it did. I got the operation in September of 2019 and then I was back playing kind of at the beginning of March of, oh, have I got that wrong? Yeah, of 20, oh, sorry, I got that wrong. It was 20, it was the end of, in, sorry, it was the end of 2018 and I got the operation. Yes. And then I was back playing in March of 2019. So I was back within, what's that, like six months? So okay. it was good, like, you know, yeah. it was nice to be back playing that stage. Oh, I'd say it was a relief. I mean, you must have been thinking, am I ever going to be free of this after a year? Even just from a lifestyle point of view, for whatever about playing rugby again. Yeah, just... well, 
no, well, that's it. Like, you know, like your back, like you've only got like one back. And if you don't, if you've got like any, like, you know, like, you know, like any issues with it, like you really have to do minded. And I, you know, like now I look after my back, like there's no tomorrow. Like I do, you know, like you have to like, because when you get an operation, you know, like that, like there's always a higher chance of it, like, you know, like repeating on you again. So yeah. you just have to mind your back. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So I guess not surprisingly, I'm sure it was very disappointing for you, but not surprisingly, your three years are up with Ulster. You've had this massive chunk taken out of the middle of it, which has probably not helped your development. And at the end of the yeah. three years, Ulster turn around and say, look, Jack, we love you and everything, but sorry, that's that's end of the road territory. Tell us about that moment of that conversation. How was news like that given to you? Yeah, we were, we got a text uh, probably on the Monday that, or, or we got a text on this Monday evening. Um, well, yeah, I got a text um, telling me that like I were, I had, I had a meeting with um, with Naz, who was the manager at the time. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, like on like the Monday morning, and I didn't really know what was going on. A um, uh, few other lads had gotten a message as well, and like we didn't really know what was going on. Whether like you know, like we were getting dropped or whether um, we were getting upgrades or like a development. Um, so I was brought in anyway the next morning and told basically that. Yeah, like it wasn't been kept on, and to be honest with you, like I, I wasn't too surprised. I was quietly maybe hoping for a development because in the October uh, we played Leinster in the A final, and I played really, really well. And off the back of that, I maybe thought that I was going to get development, but. Rugby is a rootless business, like, and um, yeah, I was brought in and I was told that like I wasn't getting anything, and that was it. Like, the mm. like that's the street. Then, like, I walked out and like I rang my dad as like I always do, and and like I told him, and it was obviously hard, hard here. Like, you're up there for like I spent three, two and a half years of my life, um, up there, and yeah, it was a hard one to take, but then obviously, like, I got the text of a man in New Zealand then the week after and then for that oh, was it the you week know, after? it opened up a lot more so I it was though yeah. it was pretty hard to hear that yeah I'm, I'm sure it was because okay I didn't realise the text from New Zealand came so quickly after the came, Ulster rejection maybe cause... not a week that was a little bit of an exaggeration it was it was within the next three weeks anyway, definitely. Right, okay. Because I'm curious, your mindset there where you've had the Leinster rejection and then the Ulster rejection yeah. comes and, okay, look, you know yourself with the Ulster thing, you were a bit unlucky with injury, but still at the end of the day, they're saying, we don't really believe in you anymore. That's ulti yeah. ultimately where they are. I mean, m like me looking in from afar and kind of, you know, through your dad and everything, I was kind of following the career and really hoping you'd do well. I think anyone, yeah. anyone looking in at that point after Ulster said no thanks, would have said, oh, well, it's not going to happen here, Jack. You're on the scrap heap, you know, that's that's just ruthless, yeah. ruthless sport. Do you remember having those thoughts or did you think to yourself, I'm still going to make it as a pro here? Or, or where was your head after being told ain't going to happen at I'd Ulster be, either? Yeah, I'd be lying if I said that maybe I thought it was over for me. Um, I was thinking that, like, maybe pro rugby isn't for me. And even, like, my dad as well, that, you know, like, when I when I rang him and told him that I was been let go, he was like, you know, like it, he, he was like, oh well, is this really for you? And mm. we had a chat, and then what you know, like ever since I was like a young lad, like I've always known that like I want to play um, pro rugby, and I suppose like at the time, like I didn't have any other opportunities. I was just playing with Hinge, like with you know, up in Ulster and playing like you know like all Ireland league rugby but other yeah. than that I didn't have anything any opportunity so yeah I did think that maybe that was it yeah. but as I said like the next opportunity was literally just around the corner so yeah um, yeah Amazing. Well, I guess, well, so that is where your story becomes kind of the million to one shot. So um, for people who haven't heard, there was a Bronson Ross who used to be at Ulster and he had obviously heard you'd yeah. been rejected. He must have, in fairness, heard decent things about you. So he sent you a text saying, do you want to come down to New Zealand? And before you know it, you're on a plane down with the Dunedin Sharks. They're an amateur side yeah. down there. 
you lose your luggage on the flight down. So basically, you turn up in New Zealand to meet some dude you've never met before and you lose your clothes and they're an amateur side. So right from the off, that's an interesting start, not to mention a pandemic about to happen. It was an interesting start, <laughs> but there's actually another part of that that actually no one knows was when I landed in Auckland, I didn't have my visa. So I was on a, <laughs> I was on a 30 day travel visa. Right. So when I landed in Auckland airport, they, obviously like my name flashed up and like I had like all these bags with me. So when I was walking through the airport, um, the immigration officer, he brought me over and I was like, oh, it's okay if we like, you know, like have a chat with you. And I wasn't really in a position um, to say no. So no, I, w- I, w- I, w- anyway. I, w- I wouldn't think then, you were. <laughs> sorry? I wouldn't think you were in a position to say no. Exactly, yeah. So here I am in like the waiting room and then next minute a lad holding a huge camera over shoulder walks in and I'm like oh holy jeez what's going on here <laughs> so like I didn't think anything of it and uh, your man he he brought me in anyway like to interview me and that's grand and then while we're chatting like your man has the camera over us like uh, like everything we're saying and then in the interview like your man is like oh you know you've got a page on uh, like on Wikipedia and I was like I'm aware of that yeah and he was like when have you looked at it last? And I was like, I don't really go look myself up now, or, like or anything. So like, I haven't looked at it at all. And he had it on his computer, and he he showed me. It. And at the time, I didn't know that on Wikipedia, like you know, like you know, like uh, what's it called? Like anyone's able to like edit it. Yeah. So it turns out that a few lads up in Belfast had gone onto my page and wrote in some like very like immature stuff. <laughs> and the whole thing's on video now, like and I'm like, Jeez, I didn't have a clue about that or whatever. <laughs> so long story short, anyway, like um the whole uh like your man who was videoing it, he was from he was from the T V show, um, you know, the one to do like the border security in New Zealand. Oh yeah. So, I don't know when it's being aired. I sincerely <laughs> hope that it's not being aired. But that was my story when I landed. And then, like, I lost my luggage when I arrived in Auckland as well. So, it was a complete nightmare to start oh off. Oh, my God. But it was a funny story, yeah. It's quite funny. Well, I think we're all looking forward to that episode when it does air to see nah, the, the gosh, panic my poor on your mother, face. I don't want her to see it. Like, they wrote in some very, very immature stuff. Well, it was, thanks for not looking re- back on now, it was hilarious. Like, thank, thank, thanks I was for worried not, I wasn't going to get interviewed on such a... Thanks for not repeating that immature stuff on No, air, yeah, way. I was very careful there, Josh. Yeah. I was very careful. So... Dunedin Sharks, amateur side. I mean, this is, um, I mean, with the greatest respect to them, by the way, this is not like a high professional level you're initially pitching in at. And no. the pandemic happens then, which I'm sure is a weird time. So you're in a new country and just s- settle down for a few months. And I think it's about ju- June you, you re-emerge. You do well enough to then play some Mitra 10 Cup with Otago. And that's where yeah. it kind of, that's, that, that's what leads to Highlanders. Ultimately, that's where they see you. So... You obviously did pretty well with Otago and had done well enough with Dunedin Sharks to, to get the gig there and they put you into the side and you seemed to take to it. You did really well in the Mitre 10 Cup. Yeah, well, I... So I began, after lockdown, I began playing with Sharks and um, we re, we actually had a really good team. Like, it'd be interesting how they go in the Ireland League. Um, yeah. We had a really good team and then I ended up playing well and then I was brought into the Otago wider squad um and training there in the early mornings like in the gym and like we did some like you know like wrestling and all that and i was playing with the sharks as well like so the coaches were always watching the all the games like so i was yeah so uh, it would have been september of that year of last of sorry august uh when they like named the squad uh in mar 10 so i was in that squad and I managed to make the bench uh, when we played Auckland there in, you know, in the opening game. I come off the bench and I had a nightmare. I actually got a yellow card and disaster. Like, I really thought that I was never going to play a game again in, you know, like with a tag. I thought I was, I thought I was done it. And then the week after, I started against Manawa 2 and then I played every game after that, pretty much. I played... 11 games in total I think so pretty much every game and then 
we lost we lost to North in, in the semi finals, which was a bit of a disaster. Um, but throughout the whole um tournament I had actually gone pretty mm. pretty well. So I wasn't sure what the Highlanders were thinking. I had an inclination that maybe I'd go in on like an injury training um contract but I wasn't actually sure. So I was just waiting. So pretty much after the Mitre 10, like I was in a bit of a limbo for two or three months. I wasn't sure whether right. to get a job um, or what I do. So I so saw like I just waited it out and I was hoping that the landers would, would ring. And I remember I went up to Queenstown for Christmas. Um, and while I was on the way up, I got a call from Tony Brown asked me to come in and train on the injury you know like replacement and I was over the moon um, mm. I couldn't believe it now to be honest with you and then yeah I went in then on the 12th of January that's when pre-season began and I was in there yeah ever since so I didn't expect it now at all um, mm. to be honest it was it was a bit of a a roller coaster, like, but I'd say it was. Yeah, yeah. it was a good experience, like, to be in there. Well, you're going from you know the Dunedin Sharks to suddenly Aaron Smith is your teammate, so that's kind of yeah unbelievable, yeah. really. And then I mean, because I do remember. So this is we're now, we're now into kind of this year territory. I do remember suddenly on I don't know waking up some morning, and all these clips of it must have been I think your Highlanders debut in Super Rugby, and it's like yeah. Joe Moody, All Blacks Joe Moody like grabbing you by the collar and like slapping your face a few times and you doing nothing yeah. back to him and I was like where where has Jack Regan what's going on here it was an unbelievable start I know it was <laughs> it was crazy yeah so actually like so like we did the hack at, at the beginning of that game and you know like w so at the beginning of pre-season like we learned the whole hack and you know like or like the week of a game as well we were up like uh we end up in a Maori, which is like like a Maori um church almost and like we did the hack up there it was an unbelievable experience but like you know like learning the hack it was just hilarious like everybody like would look down or, or like at the irish lad in the corner and be like how is he getting on with hacker like but it was unbelievable and then the whole john moody thing yeah like it 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 happened Two minutes into the game, it was a mall, and actually, I was the one who 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 was holding on to him, um, and he just lashed out. Hey, I actually couldn't believe it. I hit me in the face, like, but it was like an open, it was an open palm, so that's why he didn't get a card. Mm. But straight after it happened, I was like to him, "Oh, lad, like you're gone, like you're done, like you're <laughs> gone." But like I was. I was only acting like the big man, like, I don't know what I was doing, but um, he didn't get a card, but, like, when you look back at it now, it was only handbags, really, like, yeah. you know, it was only because I was Irish and um, he's an all black, like, everybody made a big deal out of it, like, but, yeah. you know, it was only really harmless enough, like, looking back at it now, you know. No, it was, but there was a degree of, like, welcome to the big league, son. This yeah, 100% there was, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Doing the hacker, that's kind of a cool experience, I would think, and not one many Irish players have had. Do you find, like, we always think, oh, it's a nice advantage for the All Blacks team, like it puts them in a good space and yeah. the other team maybe have to just stand there and watch it. Did you get something out of doing the hacker before a game? Did it get you up for a game in a certain kind of way? Um, I wouldn't say, no. Uh, to be honest with you, like, you know, like you learn a lot about the the you know, like the whole culture of the Maoris mm. and what the haka actually means, like people, you know, like everybody here just watches the haka, like, and like it looks, um, you know, like amazing and mm. everything like, but what it actually means is what I got out of it. It's just, it's just unbelievable, like the, the like the Maori culture and like I've got a really, you know, like new, like appreciation for that and it was just an awesome experience. Now, yeah, whenever I'm like or like at a party like or anything and I've had a few drinks or something like you know like it'll be my party piece I know all the words and I you know like or like I remember all the actions as well so it'll be my party piece like but it was an unbelievable unbelievable experience learning it and you know like I'll never forget it like um I'll never forget it yeah 
So uh, were, were you tempted to stay out beyond the season just gone or did you always want to get back to this side of the world? Were you offered a contract? Or, so how does Swansea come about then, this new part of yeah, the journey? Yeah, so the Highlanders actually offered. So, so I had an agent out there. I had an agent here as well. So the Highlanders actually offered me a one-year contract um, for next year. Right. Um, but the Ospreys had already offered a three-year deal mm. and the Ospreys one was just an opportunity that I couldn't really say no to, yeah. um, to be honest. Saying that though, I'd probably say if the Ospreys hadn't have offered anything and like I didn't have anything else over here, I wouldn't have left New Zealand. I absolutely love the place mm. and I would recommend it to absolutely anybody you know, even if you're not into like like sport or anything or like rugby, it's it's the whole like lifestyle. Like it's just an unbelievable place and like the culture and everything. I've got like everybody here now at home is pissed off like because you know like, it's all I like, go on about now at home is <laughs> no, it's like New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand. But um yeah, no, like I wouldn't have come home only for the Ospreys game, no. I love it out there. You're like that fella who's spent his Jay Wood in, in America and won't shut up about San Diego for the next five years. Yeah, that's that's literally me. Literally me. <laughs> Everyone's, I'm, you know, like I'm wrecking everybody's head. Uh, you know, like I need to stop, to be honest. God, that's amazing. Like it's a it's a million to one shot. It just shows life is never predictable, is it? To have had that eighteen months. No, well, that's it. Like I never, I was only going out there to play club rugby and maybe have a few drinks like but at the that's no like I was actually going out there you know like I always had the goal to play pro rugby like and I was going out there you know like at the bottom and to be honest I never really expected to play for the Highlanders maybe hopefully play with a tag up, but never play for the Highlanders mm. um, so it was a hell of an experience again it, when you look at like there are other Irish guys out there who are doing it uh, I was you know like Ollie is with the Crusaders and um, and Colin O'Donnell's out there as well. He's flying it like so. He was out there. He he was actually playing with the Highlanders when I landed out there. So he's been out there now. He's been in Japan. He's been everywhere over there. So he's um, flying as well. Like so. Mm. Like I'm not actually the only one. Mm. And hopefully there'll be more to come as well because. As I said, it's an unbelievable place and it is, you know, it is where everybody, you know, like aspires to be, yeah. you know, like, like the All Blacks, like so, yeah. yeah, it's great. I've heard you're talking about your own game, so you're about 6'5", which may be as weird. 6'6", six, six, I, uh, six, six, no. ah, I right, said 6'6". Okay. Six, six, I've okay. grown over the last year, so I have. Fair enough, fair enough. 6'6", six, six, <laughs> good 6'6", six, six, maybe 6'7". Six, I, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe six, seven, we'll yeah. change your Wikipedia after this now. We'll sort that out. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so six six, which uh, look, it's a strange thing to say. Maybe isn't super tall for a lock. No, it's not. Yeah, it's uh, not uh, as crazy tall, as that no, is. Yeah, and I was you, I was reading as well. You had to you have to try and bulk up and get bigger and all that kind of stuff. Tell us a bit about your game, Jack. Then, because I, I also heard you talking about a bit, bringing a bit of dog to matches. That's something you, bit you of dog. Yeah, well, you have not you obviously from like GA background like it's always you know, or like you know like they're always like you know like is the element of like a bit of dog but when I ha when I was up in Belfast that like you know like I knew it was in there but like I never really brought it out maybe right. you know like a game here or there but it wasn't every week and then when when I went out there I was on my own like and like I knew I was on my own so like I had to bring something extra like because or like an Irish lad who'd be out there you know, like they wouldn't really like respect me mm. um, so like I knew I had to bring a little bit extra and that's yeah like a little bit of dog helped me I think to get me to where I am now so um, but now like there's other you know like areas of my game where I can always work on um, like and I know that but like you're never you know like you're never going to be the perfect um player like so no there's always areas like you can work on and stuff so but mm. um and what does, i got a sorry, three what? sorry go go ahead sorry or yeah like i've got an opportunity now over in swansea where i've got a you know like i've got like i'm over there for the next three 
three years, like, so I can, you know, like, I can really, like, develop. Hopefully, like, I don't get any injuries like I did in Belfast mm. and I can really, like, work on my game. So I'm looking forward to it, like, you know. Yeah. Well, look, you need luck. You know, you've had a bit of luck after some bad luck and, and now hopefully it leads to yeah, well, that's a, it, yeah. a bit of momentum. So what, you're 24. I mean, hopefully you've got 10 years in the game and you can really kick on now. Well, hopefully, Joe, yeah, like, I'm a lock, so on average, you know, like, without any injuries, a lock might play till 33 or 34, maybe, like, but Alan Wynn's obviously, like, an exception, he's, you know, like, the man is never injured, he's, he's, he's a machine, so I'll be definitely asking him how, how he does it, like, so, mm. but hopefully yeah, I'll get another 10 odd years, yeah, but it's a short enough um, career, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Hopefully no injuries. OTB AM. So, what's that thing going around the garden? That is my uh, hour news.